Okay, I'd like to call the um, speech language pathology and audiology and hearing aid dispensers board uh, meeting uh, to order for May 14th, uh, 2021. And we are starting, my clock says 859. Um, I would first like to um, call the roll. Um, so if you could answer that you are here when I call your name. Uh, board members, um, Holly Kaiser. Here. Todd Borges. Here. Karen Chang. Here. Gilda Dominguez. Here. Debbie Snow. Here. And of course I'm here, so we do have a quorum. Um, I would like to ask the board staff if they would like to introduce themselves. <clears throat> Good morning, this is Anthony Payne, legal counsel. Any other board staff here that would like to introduce themselves? This is Sharice Burns, the Assistant Executive Officer. Good morning. Good, Dr. There, Rajo, you... oops, I'm sorry. Did, I just want to make sure that you picked up my introduction. Did you hear me? I, I did not. Okay. Um, Paul Sanchez, Executive Officer. Good morning. Good morning. Heather Olivares, Board Legislation and Regulation Analyst. Good morning, Heather. Uh, I'm not sure there's any other board staff on the call that I can see. So um, I would just like to mention that uh, we, we're not going to have public members introduce themselves at this point, but if you um, uh, choose to speak at some point, we would like you to introduce yourselves at that time. Um, moving on to agenda item six in your board book, um, we will now entertain public comment for items not on the agenda. Of course, you know that we are not able to discuss or take action on any of these items, but we would like to know um, if there are items that we should be looking at for a future meeting. So I'd like to invite anybody. So yeah, Thank moderator, you, if you can. Yes, thank you, Madam Chair. I have opened up the question and answer panel. So if any member of the public would like to make a public comment, you can type, I would like to make a comment using the field in the lower right hand corner of the screen and submit it to all panelists. We are displaying instructions for your reference. There is a three minute time limit. I'll give a 30 second warning and we do have a Dr. Amit Gazalia that would like to make a comment at this time. So Dr. Gazalia, uh, you have been unmuted. Good morning. Uh, back in February, when we had the previous meeting, I had spoken during the public comment period about the ability for audiologists to perform cognitive screenings for our patients. There are numerous studies. We have subject matter experts available nationally. All three audiology organizations include cognitive screenings within our scope of practice. Uh, after that meeting, I was told that we would have this listed in the agenda item for this meeting. However, I have heard nothing since February from anybody about this topic. Not only did I email, I've also did the public comment. And I don't know if anything is being done. I understand the, the, the board needed more time. However, nobody's reached out to either myself or some of the other leaders around the country about cognitive screening. And I'm a little disappointed that this is how we've decided to move forward on this topic. So what I'd like to do is I would like to request that whoever is leading that topic, please reach out to me. My email address, and I'll put it in the comments too, is h-e-a-r-d-r, -R, that's here, doctor, at gmail.com. And if you don't want me to be as, uh, an expert on this, that's fine. We have other audiologists, doctors around the country that can speak on this topic. But I, I'm, I'm still very disappointed that nothing's been done and it's not even on the agenda this time, even though we were told that it would be. So again, I'm at Gasalia, I'm an uh, audiologist here in Los Angeles.
All right, and that is the end of our request for public comment. Madam Chair, would you like me to go ahead and close the Q&A panel? Yes, thank you. Okay, it has been closed. Okay, comments duly noted. I'd like to move on to um, item number seven which is a review and possible approval of the June 30th, 2020 board teleconference meeting minutes. Um, I'd like to ask the board uh, if they have, or board members, if they have any comments or corrections they'd like to make to those minutes. I'm just curious, I had two copies of it under, and I don't know if there's a difference between them. They appear to be identical at first glance. Dr. Raggio, this is Sharice Burns. They, they're they identical. We just had some packet shoveling sometimes, so. I see, okay. Apologies. Okay. Okay, so hearing no uh, board comment about it, um, is there any public comment? about uh, these minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair. I have opened up the Q&A panel. If any member of the public would like to comment on this agenda item, please type. I would like to make a comment using the field in the lower right-hand corner of your screen and submit it to all panelists. We are displaying instructions for your reference and we'll give you a moment. All right, this is a moderator. I see no requests for a public comment at this time. Madam Chair, would you like me to close the Q&A panel? Yes, thank you. You're welcome. Okay, moving on to item number eight, um, review and possible approval of the February 5th, 2021 board teleconference meeting minutes. Um, I'd like to ask the board members if there are any corrections or comments to those minutes. Okay, hearing none, um, are there any uh, public comments related to those minutes? This is the moderator and I will go ahead and open up the Q&A panel. It is now available. If any member of the public would like to comment on this agenda item, please type, I would like to make a comment and submit it to all panelists. We are displaying instructions and we'll give you a moment. All right, this is the moderator. I see no request for public comment. Madam Chair, would you like me to close the Q&A panel? Yes, please. Okay, and I um, think we might need motions on the minutes as well. Yeah, I, I'll, I'll get to it. Okay, I would like to ask for a motion to accept um, the minutes from June 30th, 2020 and February 5th, 2021. Um, I believe we can uh, uh, jointly uh, accept those um, by motion. I move that we accept the minutes from June 30th and February 5th, 2021. This is Holly. Okay, Holly, do we have a second? Second. Todd, I think. Is there any further discussion about the minutes? Okay, Sharice, uh, would you call um, a vote, please? Absolutely, Dr. Raju. Aye. Ms. Kaiser. Aye. Mr. Borges. Aye. Ms. Chang. Aye. Ms. Dominguez. Aye. Ms. Snow. Aye. Motion carries. Thank you. 
Okay, um, moving on to uh, agenda item number nine, the board chair's report. Uh, we have just a few things to talk about on that. So if you look under that tab, um, first of all, we would like to uh, once again announce the uh, appointment of Gilda Dominguez, speech pathologist to the board. Um, she's a, a Southern California speech pathologist and she's going to take the seat vacated by a longtime board member, Dee Parker. Um, Sorry, I'm, I'm looking at text messages at the same time here. Um, I would also like to um, look at, a, at the reminder of our upcoming board conference call dates, which you can see on the second page. Um, uh, if there, we'll, we'll talk a minute if there's um, any questions about those dates in a moment, uh, but you can see as they are planned at this point, um, our next meeting would be August 6th um, teleconference. We have not yet learned from DCA whether we'll be able to meet in person or whether this will still be a teleconference, uh, including October 8th meeting and November 5th. Um, the last aspect of the board, board chair's report is um, talking about the subcommittees for the, um, or the standing committees, I should say, uh, for the board. Um, and the, the board members who are going to serve or have agreed to serve on those committees or are mandated to, to serve. Um, so we can see under the um, Speech Language Pathology Practice Committee, the chair is Holly Kaiser, um, Gilda Dominguez and Debbie Snow will both be uh, members on that committee. Uh, the Audiology Practice Committee is a, a little short of members um, because we uh, are still have a vacant position for an audiologist, but. Uh, I will chair that committee and Karen Chang will serve with me as public member. Um, Excuse me, Dr. Meeting. Rajo. Sorry. Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, pardon me for the interruption. I just wanted to remind everyone that this item was a hand carry just to make sure that everyone has the memo that that we added as a hand carry later. Thank you. Anybody who doesn't have this? And this is Sharice. It's also available on our website for members of the public. Okay, so if, is, if there's any board member who doesn't have it, please let us know. Um, I'll continue with the hearing aid dispensers committee. Uh, Todd Borges is the chair. I will serve as a member as well as Karen Chang, but we have some vacancies there as well uh, because we are lacking a hearing aid dispenser um, position on the board. Uh, we have a couple of ad hoc committees. Uh, the Sunset Review Committee um, will um, both myself and uh, as chair and Holly Kaiser as vice chair will serve um, on that committee. And then we've had a couple of newer committees that we've um, uh, are grateful to have members step up who are willing to um, serve. And one of them is the Enforcement Ad Hoc Committee, uh, which will be chaired by Debbie Snow. And um, also Holly Kaiser will serve on that. This uh, committee is to review and, and recommend to the board proposed revisions to the laws, regulations, and policies related to the board's enforcement of the board's practice act. Um, our other ad hoc committee is the legislative committee. It will be chaired by Karen Chang and I will serve on that committee with her. And the role of this committee is to review and recommend to the board proposed positions on legislation impacting the board, its licensees, and the board's practice act. So I'd like to ask if there are any uh, comments on any element of the um, board chair's report. I'd like to say that we will be uh, talking later on in the meeting about some of the assignments to these committees. Uh, so um, uh, you can look forward to getting some updated information on that uh, later today. But are there any other comments? Hearing none, are there any um, public comments? 
Thank you, Madam Chair. I have opened up the Q&A panel. If any member of the public would like to comment on this agenda item, please type. I would like to make a comment using the field in the lower right hand corner of your screen and submit it to all panelists. We are displaying instructions. This is the moderator. I see no requests for public comment at this time. Madam Chair, would you like me to close the Q&A panel? Yes, please. Okay, it's closed. I presume I would accept a motion to um, accept the board chair's report. Dr. Rajdo, um, we, we do not need a motion to accept the board's report. We can entertain one but it's not necessary as far as I okay. know and, and that, and that would also that would also be the case for the executive, executive officer's report Ms. Anthony am I right on that yes yes Paul that's right okay uh is there any other com um comments about it about the board chair's report you can see your terms also on this uh, page one if you um, are unsure about that. Hearing no further comment, I'd like to move on to executive officers report item 10 on the agenda. Uh, Mr. Sanchez. Good morning, everyone. Um, in item 10 of your binders, you have my report and then you have uh, separated by yellow dividers, uh, some accompanying data that goes along with it. Uh, first of all, I just want to Again, um, follow uh, Dr. Rajo's welcome uh, to Gilda Dominguez, our newest uh, speech language pathology board member. We're excited to have her on the board and excited at the work that we're going to be doing together. I also want to acknowledge um, Dr. D. Parker, who uh, served as our board chair and just was a huge asset to the board for many years and was. Um, one of the first board members that welcomed me on board when I came uh, to the board, so we're going to miss her. Um, as as I go through the report, I would like to just to keep kind of keep the discussion going. If you have any comments, uh, please feel free to uh, raise your hand and and I'll acknowledge the comments. Or if you have any questions, I'm sorry about the report. We have some newer board members, so I want to make sure that everyone understands um, the the reports that accompany it and what we're talking about as far as the administration of the board. So I, I will start with um, some of these projects and initiatives that the board office has taken on um, that are just huge. For instance, we have, as we've discussed in previous board meetings, our business modernization project which is a collaborative effort with uh, DCA's Organizational Improvement Office to provide the board with an IT solution that will transition us from our existing databases, our existing system, which we call CAS, to provide a more modern system, a more updated system that gives licensees and applications, applicants, sorry, access to even complete online transactions. This has been a long time coming. Um, a board of our size to take on a project like this, you know, can, it can present great challenges, but we're very pleased that we are moving forward. We've done some great work um, with uh, Sharice and our staff. They have spent, I, I'm not exaggerating when I say, you know, you know, countless hours working with different staff to get the foundations and the structure of this going. So today we have with us a very special guest, Sean O'Connor, who is a chief of project delivery and admin services. And, and Sean is one of those people at DCA that is just a really a bright light for us. For a board like ours, um, he's a huge asset and has just helped us in getting this project going. So. I'm going to allow Sean O'Connor to speak right now and talk a little bit about what we're doing. And please feel free to ask him any questions. He's very knowledgeable about this. He's done this with several boards. He's taken them over this mountain and they're up and running. So 
Sean, I'm going to go ahead and turn this over to you. Thank you, Paul, for those uh, kind words. I, I really appreciate it. And thank you, uh, Madam Chair and, and members of the board for the opportunity to come and um, discuss this very important effort, as, as Paul had mentioned. Um, uh, I'm Sean O'Connor, and uh, my title is the Chief of Project Delivery and Administrative Services at the Office of Information Services. And um, I've been with the um, department on the IT side for about the last 10 years. And then prior to that, um, uh, I was at uh, the Board of Behavioral Sciences, which is a board that licenses um, uh, various uh, mental health professionals. So um, I like to think that I bring, um, I'm able to bring to my position um, the perspective of both the IT side as well as um, uh, the perspective of the program side and understand where you are coming from. So um, uh, ho hopefully um, others feel that way, way as well. I like to, to think that that is the case. Um, what I'd like to do is to go through a brief um, uh, set of talking points um, uh, regarding where the uh, speech language pathology and all the audiology and hearing aid dispensers board is in the business modernization process. Um, and then, uh, as Paul had mentioned, uh, entertain any questions that you may have uh, on this. So um, the business modernization initiative, which is being uh, led by the Department of Consumer Affairs um, by two key groups. One, um, uh, Paul mentioned earlier, the Organizational Improvement Office, as well as the Office of Information Services. Um, and we're working with boards collaboratively and an emphasis on collaboratively and, and partnership uh, throughout this presentation, you'll, you'll definitely pick up on. But we're working with your board and, and your board is one of 17 programs who are going through this process. At a high level, each program goes through um, uh, a, a thought out um, and documented methodology of uh, extensive business process mapping, functional requirement gathering to ensure we know um, what the expectations are of the system um, and what the board needs to improve their services. And then um, we also proceed through a mandatory set of project planning activities that comes from the California Department of Technology. That is called the Project Approval Life Cycle or PAL, P-A-L for short. Um, and then finally, we transition into the uh, most exciting and most important phase, which is system implementation. So where is speech pathology um, uh, uh, board in all of this? Uh, the board has completed already the early stages of the business process mapping and the functional requirements development. And of the four stage project approval life cycle um, that I talked about earlier, the board is already through two of those four stages. We are actively working on the third stage um, with, uh, with, your, with Charisse and, and Paul and some of your other staff. Um, and we're targeting a project start date at this point of the fall of this year. So, um, you know, that's, that's really right around the corner. So um, we have quite a good pace that we have built up and a lot of momentum so far. And it's, it's very encouraging and very exciting. And um, it's, it's always an exciting time as we get set to embark on an, on an implementation effort. It's, it's, one of the, um, it's one of the things that, that makes my job very enjoyable is, is, um, uh, is working with the programs as we get into the implementation phase. I also wanted to mention that um, while our budget change proposal for project funding is, is not yet completely approved by the legislature, we are um, already through two of the key uh, committees. Uh, so that's very encouraging um, uh, that we, uh, our, budget pro our project funding seems to be sailing through the legislature. Um, and I wanted to emphasize something that Paul had mentioned, um, and, and it's been evident through every step of this process, is, is that this is a really, um, a business driven uh, initiative. We have found based on our uh, experiences on IT projects in the past um, and projects that I've uh, led and been a, been a key member of that um, the business um, uh, ownership and buy in and partnership with the IT side is really the most critical thing to the overall success of the, of the project. Um, that partnership, that good communication, um, that uh, 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 spirit to work together prioritize, plan, and replan. Those are all the things that really make an IT system work. Um, so, uh, you know, I think to this date, and Paul alluded to it earlier, um, uh, we have been achieving that, and um, I'm very, very encouraged, and I'm very optimistic about um, uh, the prospects of having a very successful um, uh, IT effort that really substantially improves the services that the board can provide to its constituents. So, um, we've been hitting all our marks there to date. Um, so, a uh, couple things that I wanted to mention about what we have done from a planning perspective 
and uh, drawn on lessons learned from previous projects to really um, make sure that we're on a pathway to success for this board. Um, uh, part of it is um, to, to borrow a cliche, we plan, we plan, and we replan. Um, uh, the CDT project approval life cycle uh, mandates that we complete adequate planning uh, prior to actually starting any IT project. Um, so it may seem like technicality, but one of the things that um, is important is, you know, we don't establish an actual project budget or project schedule until we have uh, brought on um, the vendors that we have contracted with and um, uh, understood that our project schedule and project uh, budget baselines are actually feasible. Um, so that's an important uh, aspect of, of ensuring success on the project. And we also, um, uh, uh, we also pursue a implementation methodology um, that is uh, what is referred to as agile. Uh, folks uh, who are familiar with um, uh, IT projects, you may have heard this. It's kind of a buzzword that is thrown out around uh, quite a bit, an agile development methodology. But I'll kind of characterize it very briefly for you. And we've had a lot of success with this on, on many of the projects that we've done so far. Um, one, uh, we, the difference between doing an agile project versus um, the previous method of, of doing projects was we have, um, uh, in the old way, we would pretty much start a project work for three years on something and then implement all the functionality all at once um, with you know big complex data conversion major staff disruption where your entire staff is going home on a friday coming back on a monday with an, an um, entirely new system and uh, a lot of high intensity um, high risk kind of retraining the new way that we've been doing things which is um, uh, now possible because of advancements in technology that allow us to do this but we can incrementally roll out software. We can divide up the work into logical chunks and push to production more frequently. So we could position ourselves, for example, to um, uh, within six months of the project start, um, uh, or certainly less than a year, um, be able to implement multiple online renewal transactions or multiple online initial license or exam transactions for your most um, uh, uh, populous license types, um, instead of delaying until the end of the project and rolling everything out all at once. And this is a process that is not really theoretical. This is a process that's been in practice. We've done this on um, our uh, first business modernization uh, project that is uh, within five months of completing. Um, we've, uh, we have business modernization cohort one that is um, uh, out a little ahead of where you are at in the process, but they've actually implemented, you know, uh, dozens of transactions online, um, online complaint forms, back office evaluations, um, online uh, application status, uh, real-time application status updates for uh, licensees and applicants, as well as um, you know email communication back and forward uh, about deficiencies. So we've used this process to achieve um, all of those improvements uh, for programs already within DCA's portfolio. Uh, so we're excited to, to bring something that works to your program um, and uh, really learn from some of the lessons that we've had uh, so far on the projects. Just one more point that I wanted to make um, regarding uh, working with a, a vendor on this project. One of the key aspects of success for DCA on recent projects is the way that we structure any vendor contracts. So um, previously, there was um, models of contracts where um, you got to do a big contract with a vendor or maybe a time and materials contract that didn't have a lot of deliverable quality checkpoints uh, in it. But we've really arrived at a contract um, sort of management structure uh, that we've utilized for about the past three years that works well. And what we do is much like we uh, break up the functionality that we want to implement from an incremental perspective, we um, uh, also manage the, the contractor in, in a similar way. So we take an overall contract that might span um, a two to three year period, and we uh, take the work that is outlined in that contract and break it down into usually monthly increments to say um, what deliverables, what functionality do we expect you to be working on over this 30-day um, period, what staff are working on it, um, and what will be the evidence or measures that the work has been completed. Um, and then the state would approve that ahead of time so that we are aware of what's going to be going on, who's going to be working on the project, um, uh, and we can comment if, we're, if there are staff on the project that have been uh, non-performant. Uh, and, uh, you know, exclude them from, from future work order authorizations. Um, and the um, process uh, for that 
then at the end of it, once they've completed all the tasks and the deliverables, um, the state would review it, make sure all of those were completed uh, to the quality that we, we would expect before they're allowed to invoice. So one way to think of it is kind of like a little mini subcontract within our larger contract. Um, uh, and it allows a great deal of control for us and also allows us to control quality as well as cost uh, throughout the project. Because if something's not going quite as we um, anticipated, we can take a week or so and say, let's sit down and have a conversation about how we're going to uh, change things for the next month before we approve this next uh, month's work order authorization. So I know that's a lot of details. Um, I'll just kind of wrap up with a couple final comments here. Um, Paul alluded to it earlier, but um, we've really worked um, extensively with Paul, Sharice, um, and all the other staff at Speech to uh, put you guys in a position uh, to succeed on this. And I'm just really grateful and encouraged by the partnership today um, and the support from the leader leadership at your board has been uh, phenomenal. And uh, I look forward to uh, playing a role in uh, the success and um, improving your services through this process moving forward. Um, I would be happy to entertain any questions uh, that the group might have. Thank you. Thank you, Sean. Are there any questions from any of our board members? Hi, this is Holly. Thanks for that great report. Um, I'm wondering in the incremental rollout, do you have any information on the priorities of what will be rolled up first, second, third? We haven't um, baselined that um, entirely yet, but in discussions with Paul and I, um, uh, uh, he, he can chime in as well here. That that um, that priority is set uh, based on the the business priority, and I think. Um, they kind of in our early planning discussions, while this is not set in stone, there's an emphasis on um, online, you know, turning on more transactions online um, and thinking about strategically doing it for um, uh, specific types of license types first um, uh, and then focusing on the others as, as we move forward. But Paul, um, I, I'd be happy if you wanted to, to take part of this as well. Uh, yes, I think, you know, as we look at the the workload and what we're trying to accomplish, as Sean mentioned, we're looking at trying to get the most out of some of these beginning stages, for instance, um, online services and licensing. We have different licensing populations, so we might start with the largest population first and then work our way through them. But the emphasis has been dealing with licensing in, in the very beginning as far as the functionality of, of this product. Did that answer your question, Holly? Yeah, thank you very much. Thank you. Are there any other questions on the business modernization project? I, I know it's, it, it's a lot of information. As you can imagine, you know, this, this touches on so many things, even just in some of the, the discussion there, what Sean was referring to, you know, we're talking about licensing, contracts, um, admin, IT, even all the way to you know going before legislative committees. So there's a lot involved here. And I just want to you know, thank everybody involved for getting us to the point that we are. And you know, we look forward to an end product that will be beneficial to um, our consumers and our licensees and applicants. If there are no questions, th thank you again, Sean. If there are no questions, I'm going to go through um, the rest of my report if you are following along my report, the next item I wanna talk about was our board office relocation. This has been in the planning for some time. Um, I wanna say we started talking about this probably um, almost five years ago. So it's taken us some time to get to where we found the right location and we're able to make this work, but we're really proud and happy to announce that we have moved to our new location. We're located now at 1601 Response Road in Suite 260 in Sacramento. That, if you're familiar with Sacramento, is still somewhat in the same area that we're in right now. We're close to Cal Expo. This new facility that we have um, is much more adequate to what we're trying to accomplish and is able to, if you ever visited our former board office, you would know that it was this kind of long rectangular office space 
that was designed for a time when the board had, you know, fewer staff and fewer licensees. Probably early on when the hearing aid dispensers had just come on to be part of the board. So we have grown quite a bit as our, our numbers will show, as our staffing is shown, and we wanted, we have been planning this for some time. So we were able to move during the month of April. We're still even doing some unpacking as we speak, but we're very happy and we look forward to a time when all of you can come and visit our new office. I just want to talk a little bit about all of the different all of the different things that the board office has been taking on and just want to ask for your patience and understanding as we have gone through this pandemic there has been a lot of shuffling and a lot of um, juggling on management part management's part so it's it's been challenging and you know now as i reported in the last meeting we had just reopened um Back in February, our board office is still being staffed on a rotational basis, but we're getting more and more of our staff back into the office and trying to keep up with the workload and some of these other projects that were already in the planning. Um, we have one vacancy right now for legislation and regulations. As Sean mentioned, we had some other BCP work that's being done in association with the project of business modernization. So we want to try to keep up with our work and try to also staff that project and the, the growth that is that is happening. Any questions so far before I start talking about our budget? I'll go on to uh, B, which is our budget report. And the actual, we have a budget report or what is actually an expenditure report behind that first yellow divider. And that report reflects fiscal activity through March 31st. This is based on data that's provided by the DCA budgets office and, and they work with us on making sure that we're on track to not go over our budget and to um, have enough to get us through the year. If you look at that budget report, what it is, is it's, um, it's a detailed itemized sheet that shows us every category that we have budgeted and what we're spending. The very last uh, group of columns reflects fiscal year, the current fiscal year, 2021, and then the, the columns before that are previous years. So you can see if you follow that, what the expenses have been in the past and where we are now, if you look at current year expenditures, which is the blue column, and projections to year end, which is a column, um, two columns down to the right. The important thing to look at here is what our projection is getting towards the year end. So if you look at fiscal year 2021, our governor's budget is almost $2.5 million. In the green column, it shows you our projections to year end, which is about 2.3 million. And our projection of what we're going to have left over at the end of the year, which is approximately $27,000 with a surplus of about 1%. That's actually uh, less than what we typically have reverted. This money goes into our, this money goes into our speech language, pathology, audiology, and hearing aid dispensers fund. But this is less than what we have typically reverted. And one of the reasons is the more work the board is doing, the more money that we're spending and we've had a lot going on. So we will watch our budget closely and we'll make sure that, um, you know, we stay on track and make any necessary adjustments. The next item in my report is a regulations report. And Paul, can I just ask a question here? Yes, please. This is Marcia. I was just wondering, I was just looking at the travel in state at, at $6,300 approximately. Um, since COVID has kind of kept us all in, uh, from traveling anywhere, I'm just wondering where where that money is going. You, you're talking about uh, the, the overage? No, I'm just under current year expenditures under travel in state. I'm just wondering uh, what goes into that that value of 6,000 since we haven't been able to travel 
much at all. Uh, yes, and uh, there there are still other other individuals that are associated with our board that use travel, and that would that would be taken out of our travel budget. For instance, we have examiners and subject matter experts that have worked on workshops during the year, examiners that have helped us conduct exams, because even though our board office has been shut down much of the year, we have made adjustments to continue having practical exams. And I'll ask Sharice Burns if there's anything else that I'm missing as far as what would come out of our travel item. That would. This is Sharice. That that would be it. So examiners um, and including um, Office of Professional Examination Services workshop travel. So there have been a few of those that do still require travel that have happened, um, and then any of the examiner travel as well. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. And, and just like our checking account at home or our personal accounts, you know, if you you may not spend money in one area, but there may be areas that you go over in other areas. So you'll see that there's some red in the area of unencumbered balance and there's some black. So the hope is that, you know, we keep it all at, within the black at the at the bottom line there. But that, that's a great question, Dr. Rajo. Are there any other questions on the budget before I go on? So item C is, a you, you see a table there that kind of reflects the pending rulemaking files that are either in the initial review process or the rulemaking process with the Office of Administrative Law. Um, I'm happy to announce that the AB 2138 criminal conviction, substantial relationship, and relate rehabilitation criteria. Um, those, those regs were a result of Assembly Bill 2138 and were a priority for the board. They were, you know, bumped in front of it, every other rulemaking file that we were working on. And we were just told that our regulations were adopted just a few days ago. So we're really pleased with that. We have a few others that are that are in the works here our fee increase, um, our RPE direct supervision requirements that we're working on. These are regs that have been noticed. And then the last one there, um, there there's a lot of text in that, but you can see that we have approved language. I want to also make something clear because the board has approved language for other work that we're doing, we are doing, but that ha that if that's not on this list, that means that we haven't started the process by putting out um, a, that initial notice. So if you don't see it here, it's not because we've forgotten about it. It's just because we haven't started the work um, with with that. It's also important when, when the board approves language that everyone understands that there's still a, a pretty detailed and long process with the Office of Administrative Law. And it's not until it gets to that point that it actually becomes adopted and codified in regulation. The next section of my report is our licensing report. And this is uh, just a, a table that I like to provide to give us a, a snapshot. It, it's not perfect, but what it does is it just kind of shows us where we are today and allows us to kind of take the pulse on our licensing workload. I've been doing this for several years, and what this shows us is that, you know, we have kind of stayed in a peak season and a kind of high level of uh, workload during the year, partially in due, due to our staffing, but also the flow of license applications that has come in has just been pretty steady. And instead of getting that one big spike, it's been pretty steady throughout the throughout the year. But we also Put this information on our website. We're trying um, to make, you know, every effort we can to let applicants know how long it is taking for the board to process their applications. And these are numbers that reflect completed applications, applications that come in in which we have all of the information that we need. And section E of my report is our practical ex examination report. Um, I want to commend staff because. During during this time, as I've mentioned before, we have been able to conduct practical examinations. We've had um, some 
examiners, subject matter experts that have been great and have, you know, really stepped up to help us during this time. I know that we need examiners throughout the year. We can, we can always use that. The more examiners we have, the more examinations we can conduct, but we have done a, a really good job considering the, you know, all of the issues that have worked against us to continue with the practical examination. During the pandemic, um, again, as I've mentioned in the past, Sharice uh, and staff were able to conduct these examinations in a very large room that provided for, you know, the appropriate distancing. There was a lot of cleaning and sanitizing going on um, as people were coming in and out of that room. Our new offices will allow us to have examinations in house. So we have two examination rooms that are part of our new office. And I think that's going to allow us to continue conducting um, steady examinations. The next item on my report is uh, just the enforcement report. And I want to, before I go to the enforcement report, I want to direct you to the second divider which is the licensing statistics. And behind that divider, you can see a chart that shows you the total number of licenses issued to date. This shows you um, our numbers for the last uh, six years and our current year. So you could see that every year uh, we issue um, in anywhere from 36 to 3,800 uh, licensee licenses, and it shows you the different categories of of license that we issue. Most boards don't have this many license types. We have, you know, quite a few. So, our staff have to understand all the different um, requirements, and they have to understand a little bit more than than most licensing analysts at at DCA. Um, if you look at the table underneath licenses issued that shows you licensing population and the real interesting thing to see here especially for some of our newer members is the numbers if you look at for instance uh you know fiscal year uh, 15 16 just five years ago um we were over 22,000 in the number of licensees that were under the board's purview over the years that has increased, uh, today we are at 36,000. So along with that increase in our licensing population is the increase in our workload. And you know the priorities change, so it's our job to make sure that we prioritize that workload and do, do some of the things that, you know, that are most important first. Which leads us to enforcement. Um, I want to, Behind the next uh, yellow divider is our enforcement report. And this is broken down. Uh, the, the first uh, section there is complaints and convictions. And you can see that the number of complaints and convictions that have come in this year have, have decreased. During this, uh, during this same uh, period of time, you know, we've, we've continued to work these uh, complaints. We've issued one citation this year for um, unlicensed activity, not cooperating with board investigation. There are currently about 10 discipline cases that are pending with the attorney general's office. Those are cases that are currently being uh, worked or, or litigated. In addition to that, the board is currently monitoring 19 probationers for which three required drug and alcohol testing and six are untold status. If you go back to my report under section F, you'll see a table and that table shows you the disciplinary actions that have been adopted by this board during the past 12 months. These are listed in chronological order. Um, as Tanisha Ashford has communicated with you on updates of some of the disciplinary actions that have been taken, I wanna point out that also included here are voluntary surrenders of license and um, default revocations. A voluntary surrender of license can be approved by the executive officer and a default re revocation um, can also be approved. And 
A default decision is when a respondent does not respond to the board's accusation or does not show up to their hearing. Those can both re result in default decisions. That's the end of the information in my report. Are there any questions from any of our board members? This is Marcia. I have a question. Yes. Um, under quarter three uh, for the um, enforcement report, it, it still combines speech pathology and audiology. And I thought we were going to make an effort to try to separate those, but not seeing that on the report, can you tell us the under complaints received? There are 42 during that quarter. Can you break it down for me in terms of how many are speech pathology, how many are audiology? Yes, I could talk a little bit about that. So, one of the um, first, let me go back to the, the way the system collects data, it's separated into two accounts. Um, the only reason that it's separated into two accounts is because when the hearing aid dispensers uh, bureau came on to the board, those systems were not merged because that would have re required another pro project to turn them into one. So the databases uh, continue to be two separate databases. So we actually work out of two different databases. That's the only reason that the um, information is separated the way it is. If we had, if we didn't have that, we would probably just have one lump sum number of what the complaints received are. So what we did talk about was at the end of the year, we will break it down and provide a report that kind of shows a breakdown of speech and in audiology so that um, board members can kind of know what the difference is. I can't tell you what the breakdown is. Um, as far as uh, speech and audiology, I know that the majority of those are going to be on the speech language pathology side, just because of the you know the difference in numbers. There's a much larger percentage of of speech um, speech language pathologist assistants and RPEs. So, did you did you want any other information other than the numbers as far as uh, the percentage, or were you talking about the types of complaints that come in? And not necessarily the types, although that is okay. an important thing too. But um, I thought you had sent me a slide that showed the breakdown uh, for audiology, and it was a, a relatively small number relative to forty-two. But um, that's all I wanted to know: is it, are you are going to do an end of the year separation of those two things, um, so we can really know not only um, what types, who's who's making these violations, but what types of violations, so we can. Hopefully, uh, work with the professional organizations to curb some of that behavior. Yes, and and the and the slide that uh, that Dr. Rajo is referring to is a slide that shows the type of enforcement um, work that we do, and it's for the purpose of outreach. Uh, when I'm presenting to licensee groups, um, I like to talk about enforcement. And talk about the types of complaints that we get, and those those types of complaints vary from license type to license type. So, at the next board meeting, uh, we'll be able to uh, compile the statistics and at least break down the numbers that can show um, how many of these, how many of the complaints that we get um, are from speech language pathology, how many are from audiology. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. I, I see uh, Sharice Burns has your hand raised. Yes, I, I just wanted to mention also, it, it, it also would be a good idea for the uh, enforcement ad hoc committee to also take a look at the statistics and data that the board is reporting and see if there's uh, more valuable ways to present our data and so on and so forth. So that might be something that would be good for them to take a look at so that um, even though we can pull a lot of different data and slice it up in a lot of different ways, Kind of what's what's the most important for the board to be provided um, at each board meeting or at the end of each fiscal year or or the same. So that's actually a good idea to have that discussion at that committee as well. That, that's a yeah, that's agree. a great point. Um, yeah, and before I get to Holly's question, I just wanted to 
uh, talk a little bit about that. This, these reports that we give you are for your benefit, and we do want to make them so that it's information that you can use. This is a report that we have talked about changing for some time now, so I think that that would be a great thing for the committee to look at. Um, and what Sharice is referring to also is those ad hoc committees that we've talked about. The enforcement committee, um, we do want, I know we've discussed this in the past, we want every board member at some point to be part of that committee so that they can come and see um, what our processes are. This is one of the most important things you do at, as a board member, the, not the most important. And I think it's really important that you understand the enforcement process too. So understanding the, the information, the, the workload and what is being done is important. Let's look at this report and see if we can improve it. I see Holly Kaiser has a question. Yeah, thank you. Um, on your report about licenses issued and licensee population, um, there's one that's zero throughout the years. I actually don't know what SPT stands for. Can you enlighten me, please? Yes, that is a speech language pathologist temporary. So um, it, it's not common to get a temporary license request um, because the speech language pathologists have the um, triple C route to get licensed in this state. So often there's not a need for that. We have we have several temporary type of licenses. Uh, for instance, the RPE is a temporary license, a hearing aid dispenser trainee. And then we have the traditional temporary licenses Sharice referred to that are for those people that come in from out of state. So yeah, I guess that's one category that we don't use a whole lot of. Are there any other questions? Well, thank you. If there are no other questions, oh, I see uh, Gilda Dominguez has a question. Good morning. Um, this isn't a question, but just a comment. Um, as a new board member, I would like to thank um, the board members for the warm welcome. And I'm looking forward to working with everyone um, regarding our mission, our vision, and our values. So um, I appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Um, Paul, would you like to entertain any public comment on your report? Sure. All right, this is a moderator. And I have opened up the Q and A panel. If any member of the public would like to comment on this agenda item, please type. I would like to make a comment using the field in the lower right hand corner of your screen and submit it to all panelists. We are displaying instructions for your reference. All right, this is a moderator. I see no request for public comment at this time. Madam Chair, would you like me to close the Q&A panel? Yes, thank you. All right, it's closed. Okay, thank you for that report. Um, I'd like to suggest that we um, continue with one more um, agenda item before we take a bio break. I hope that's okay with everyone. Um, I would like to introduce uh, the next topic and the, and our uh, our guest uh, today. Um, this um, Mr. Brian Clifford is going to give us a DCA update on um, the board and bureau relations. Mr. Clifford is the senior manager for planning and imp implementation um, at the state of California. He is part of the executive office of the Department of Consumer Affairs. So, Mr. Clifford, welcome. Thank you. I just want to make sure everyone can hear me. I can hear you. Wonderful. Uh, good morning, board chair and members. I'm Brian Clifford with the Department of Consumer Affairs. Thank you for allowing me this opportunity to provide a department update to your board. First off, I would like to welcome Gilda Dominguez as the newest member of the board. Um, congratulations on your appointment and thank you for your willingness to serve. And on behalf of the department, I'd also like to thank uh, former member Dee Parker for her dedicated service to the board and for her commitment to protecting California consumers. The first item I'd like to talk about is COVID-19. It's affected every aspect of our work for more than a year. 
Um, thank you to executive officer Sanchez and to board staff who've been working so hard to maintain excellent customer service throughout these challenging times. DCA offices remain open with preventative measures to safeguard the health and safety of our employees and visitors. Boards and bureaus are looking ahead to what changes can be made permanent for efficiency and employee well-being, such as telework and eliminating paper processes. I encourage all members and the public to visit DCA's COVID-19 webpage for updates and resources on the state's reopening plan, public health guidance, vaccinator resources, vaccine distribution, and more. DCA is receiving many questions about when and how boards will be able to meet again in person. I don't have a definitive answer today, but would like to offer some clarification. As you know, the ability of the board to meet remotely is tied to the governor's executive orders and the state of emergency. When these are lifted, the board will be required to follow all aspects of the Open Meetings Act, including publicly noticed and accessible locations. We do not know yet when this will happen or if any changes in the law might occur before that. DCA will do all it can to assist the boards and bureaus to transition safely and with enough time to plan for in-person meetings. While we continue to meet remotely, should your board be interested in doing video meetings, DCA has created a video background with the DCA logo that board members can use. If you're interested in this and would like your board's logo added to the graphic, please let us know and our communications team would be happy to provide you with that. The next item I wanna talk about was appointments. It's one of our top priorities in board and bureau relations, and I would like to pro provide a brief overview. Currently, the board has three vacancies, an audiolo audiologist, a hearing aid dispenser, and a public member appointed by the governor. DCA and all the appointing authorities share the goal of a fully seated, diverse, and effective board. Filling current and upcoming vacancies is a priority. That being said, if any members know any great candidates or if any members of the public attending the meeting are interested in serving, please find the link titled board member resources on DCA's homepage to apply for an appointment. For current board members, 2021 is a mandatory sexual harassment prevention training year. This means all employees and board members are required to complete the training during this year. As a reminder, newly appointed and reappointed board members are required to attend board member orienta orientation training within a year of appointment or reappointment. DCA is, ex is excited about the new and improved training, which has been updated based on board member feedback and requests. The next training will be held on June 23rd via WebEx. To register, please visit the DCA Board Members Resource Center on DCA's website. And finally, I'd like to update you on two new exciting initiatives launched by DCA's director uh, in 2021 to enhance DCA services to all boards and bureaus. The first is an executive officer cabinet. This group of board and bureau executives has been formed to maintain regular communication, provide feedback and information to DCA, and assist with special projects that impact all boards and bureaus. The group has met several times and is making progress on projects such as standardizing board reporting requirements. The second is the Enlightened Licensing Project. This work group is helping individual boards and bureaus streamline and make their licensing processes more effect effective and efficient by utilizing best practices, information technology, and cost saving me measures. The work group has begun a deep dive into the licensing processes at the Board of Registered Nursing with process improvements being implemented in real time. We will continue to update you on these initiatives as they progress. As always, Board and Bureau Relations is here to help, and if there's anything we can do to assist, please just let us know. This concludes my presentation, and I'm happy to turn it back over to the chair. Okay, I'd like to ask if there are any uh, board question, board member questions uh, regarding Mr. Clifford's report. Gil, did you have your hand up, or is that from before? Um, sorry, I would uh, just like, I'm sorry. No Go question. Ahead. No question. Thank you. Okay. Um, I'm just curious about a, a couple of things. Um, how long would you say it's taking to fill uh, appointments once applications come in? Do you look for a certain number of them? Um, what is the process and how long is it taking to get a new appointment to a board? I think it varies um, depending on the board and the situation. Um, I don't know that there's a standard time for that. Um, but, and obviously it would also depend on how many applicants for the, or um, 
people that are interested in the appointments. You have a ballpark? <laughs> Unfortunately, I, I I don't. Um, I I I don't think there there's a standard uh, amount of time um, in terms of of how quickly those get filled. Okay, we're always worried about a quorum here because um, uh, we have several vacancies. Um, the, well, I just want. I'm sorry. Go ahead. No, I was. I'm sorry to interrupt. I just wanted to to say we we always are monitoring board membership on all the boards to uh, to make sure that um, as those quorum issues uh, become a higher risk, um, that those are elevated and 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 the folks that um, need to know are aware of that. Okay, that's good to know. Uh, could I just uh, verify something you said? Uh, did you say that the new member orientation, if, if that's the right title, is June 23rd, the next one? Yes. Okay. Do any other board members have questions or comments about <clears throat> Mr. Clifford's report? Seeing none, um, I would like to open um, the floor to uh, for public comment or questions. Thank you, Madam Chair. I have opened up the Q&A panel. If any member of the public would like to make a comment on this agenda item, please type. I would like to make a comment in the field in the lower right-hand corner of your screen and submit it to all panelists. We are displaying instructions for your reference. This is a moderator and Madam Chair. I see no requests for public comment at this time. Shall I close the Q&A panel? Yes, please. Okay, it's closed. Um, so I'd like to recommend that we take a, um, a bio break till about 1020, if that would be okay with everyone. So, hearing yes. no complaints <laughs> i guess uh, that would that would be okay can you set the clock for us moderator yes we'll set the clock and post the time okay thank you okay i would like to uh, welcome everyone back to the meeting um we're going to have a, a small change in the uh, amendment to the agenda. We're going to have some um, individuals come on who are, will be our guest speakers for item number 12, and they won't be available till about 11. So we are going to move ahead to um, agenda item number 13, uh, update on speech and hearing related DCA waivers related to COVID-19 state of emergency. Um, I'd like to turn it over to Sharice Burns and hopefully Mr. Clifford is still here who might be able to also assist with some information. Sharice, thank are you. you here? Yes, thank yeah. you, Dr. Razio. Mm -hmm. uh, so as most everyone is aware, uh, during the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, the state of emergency declared by the governor has allowed us to do waivers um, of some of our licensure requirements um, outside of those waivers. Of course, the board can't just waive its regulatory requirements um, and definitely not statutory either. So um, some of those include the continuing education requirement waiver that extends the requirement. So essentially you have more time to uh, meet the CE requirements. It does not change the CE requirements. We have had quite a few questions about that. So there is still a live requirement for the CE. It is just delayed through the waivers. So again, you have more time to accrue those hours, but the mixture of them are still the same. Uh, and then we also still have the reactivation requirement um, that is waived through July 1st of 2021. We have the direct monitoring requirements and direct supervision, um, which allows telesupervision of speech language pathology assistance and RPE, Required Professional Experience Licensees, that is still in effect. Um, it is currently now through June 30th. 
We also have the uh, modification for limitations on renewing hearing aid dispenser temporary license and hearing aid dispenser trainee licenses. That is also extended through June 30th. Uh, the modifications for limitations on requirements for extending RPE so that they can be extended beyond the one extension. Um, that was also, uh, that waiver was also renewed and it is good through June 30th. Um, again, the board tried for a couple other ones, including the modification of the 12th month uh, full-time re experience requirement for audiologists, that waiver was denied. And the board subsequently tried to get a modification of the self-study restrictions for CE, and that was also denied. Um, so those were not able to get. Um, of course, we've been working uh, collaboratively with DCA to ensure that waivers are extended um, during the pandemic, um, but that we will also be working together to unwind waivers over the next few months as the governor opens up the state and then eventually um, takes uh, rescinds the state of emergency orders um, that are currently in place. So it it probably won't be an immediate cutoff, but we'll be looking to unwind those um, in the next few months. So um, people should be aware of that. Um, so um, just kind of keep that in mind. Um, at this point, we're not asking for any new waivers. Um, I think we've kind of gotten those that we needed to get through the pandemic. And so now we are just kind of keep an eye in, an eye out on the current waivers and how long we need to have them extended for um, and then kind of working with DCA on how they unwind these over the next few months. Are there any questions? This is Marcia. I was just wondering if you could give us an example of, of one of these waivers and how how might it be unwound, so to speak? And are you saying the DCA is going to uh, unwind these as opposed to the board staff? Uh, yes, board staff actually don't have any um, a, a, any power to unwind these. Um, so, I see. Yeah, so this is all um, the director is given the authority through the governor's executive order. And so it's essentially DCA's um, prerogative on how to unwind them. I would assume as the state is reopened and restrictions are removed that slowly those those requirements will start to go away as we see. Um, no restrictions on public gatherings, maybe later this year, I would assume, maybe the CE requirement will slowly start to be unwound um, to where it might be extended a, a one or two more times is my guess. Um, I, I'm just throwing that out there as an idea and then it would um, no longer be, be extended um, since people can now go to live events and live events can start being scheduled again. Um, but I would I would put a caveat on here and remind everyone that live means also live interactive CE. So anytime that it's online, but it's interactive with the participants or the, the presenter, that's considered live as well. Um, just like Kasha's live uh, conference this year is also considered live. So, so we, we just wanna keep that in mind as well. Looking at the documents uh, under this tab, it looks like do they uh, extend these waivers or have they been extending them every two months or so, or is it quarterly? It seems to be on a 60 day cycle seems to be the preference. Yeah, okay. Um, so it's kind of every two months. I think there was one. Um, the CE one got off by a month. I'm not completely sure why, um, but it was. It was extended through May this time, so April and May. So that that should be good now. Um, so they're back on the 60 day. I know the one for reactivations was a longer extension, um, and that one probably I would guess might unwind sooner because as we're needing less healthcare professionals for the COVID-19 pandemic response, then you won't you won't need to waive the reactivation requirements for much longer. I don't know if Mr. Clifford would like to chime in on this topic or not. Um, yeah, or this is, this is Brian yeah. Clifford. Um, well, and, and as an example of maybe how um, something might be unwound, um, the continuing education one might be an example where um, folks are have a waiver and are able to renew without doing CE at some point in time. I think there'll be a a cutoff of that, and um, so uh, that stuff our OIS staff might be putting together that would require now um, individuals to check yes I have done CE in order to renew 
Um, and so that's something DCA would handle and then um, licensees would have to go, uh, be back in compliance with that. Okay, thank you. Can I just ask a general question, Mr. Clifford, um, how the state looks at any CDC recommendations that come down? Does the state follow those or do we look at our own statistics and our own situation and not really follow what um, the CDC is recommending? Um, that's that's a that's a little over my head. Um, oh, I'm sorry. Uh, I'm, I'm sure. Inappropriate. I'm sure the Department of Public Health um, is looking at things like that um, when taking in consideration um, their decisions. Um, so, and then yeah. you take your cues from them. Yeah, I, I we're we're following uh, direction uh, given by the administration. Yeah. Okay. And and I would suggest the CDC's recommendations also give deference to state and local jurisdictions. So, as the Department of Public Health and um, OSHA and the rest give out requirements, that would also dictate what has to be done in offices mm -hmm. at the board um, and then kind of in this state. Makes sense. Are there any other questions, uh, comments about um, item number thirteen? From the board. Oh. In the absence of any other questions, I do want to remind anybody that's listening or watching afterwards that um, we do have listservs that send out notifications regarding the COVID-19 waivers. And if you go to our website, www.speechandhearing.ca.gov, up at the top of the screen, there's a little yellow bar that says not getting COVID-19 related waiver updates from the board question mark, update your email address with the board. And if you click on that link and send us your email address, we'll make sure we have it updated in our system, just in case we have an old ad email address or no email address for you. That way you're getting a COVID-19 related waiver update as soon as we are able to send them out. Could you repeat that of, of where that location is to submit that? Absolutely. So on our website, www.speechandhearing.ca.gov, at the very top of the web page, uh, the third yellow line has a not getting COVID-19 related waiver updates from the board question mark. Um, on that line, you'll see a link that says, update your email address with the board, email us here. And if you click on that, it'll open up an email for you in whatever email system you're using to send to our speech and hearing at dca.ca.gov so that you can update your email address and we'll go ahead and update our listservs that send out the emails about COVID-19 related waivers. Okay, thank you. I'd like to ask at this point if there are, oh, Paul. Yes, I just wanted to just kind of echo what Sharice Burns is saying. For those of you that are listening um, or following along, we have some people from our professional associations I know that are listening. And this has been a great effort um, in collaboration with some of those folks uh, from the different organizations that have worked with us. But I just want to make sure that you're telling your members to go to our website first and look for that information. Um, Sharice Burns and our staff have put information out there, FAQs, and we will continue putting that out there so that people are updated on what direction we go with these waivers. DCA also has their own COVID waiver page. So I just want to put that commercial out there to make sure that people know to go to our website for this information. Thank you. Thank you. He's not seeing any other uh, board questions or comments. I'd like to ask for any public comment um, on this item. Thank you, Madam Chair. I've opened up the Q&A panel. If any member of the public would like to comment on this agenda item, please type. I would like to make a comment using the field in the lower right-hand corner of your screen and submit it to all panelists. We are displaying instructions for your reference. All right, we have a Linda Pitford who would like to make a comment. Linda, I'll let you know when you've been unmuted. She'll have three minutes with the 30 second warning. And Linda, you've been unmuted. Thank you. Yeah, this is Linda Pitford. I'm a speech language pathologist and uh, the media past chair of CASHA. And um, I certainly thank um, 
Sharice and Paul and the, the folks even at DCA on helping us get the word out on these different waivers. And we are sending people. So when cash is sending out links, um, we're making sure that it includes the link for them to go to the licensing board website, that they're not just taking an edited version for us. So thank you so much for making that available to everyone. I think my one comment that I'm hearing from the field uh, on concerns for continuing the waivers um, is that in the fall, we already are hearing that some parents are probably not going to let their kids go back to school. And so an RPE might have a caseload that some of the kids are done virtually, some of them are done live. So. I'm certainly emphasizing that we don't have the expectation that we'll have a waiver in the fall and that supervision of RPE supervisors, we should expect that it's going to be done live. So we're making those kinds of plans, but there is concern there out in the community. Should the waiver for telesupervision go away, um, that maybe that supervision requirement is going to be a little bit more difficult to meet. Um, my hope is that there's enough kids live that they would get hours of live supervision. And then certainly if they need to do extra supervision hours to catch those um, students that are still virtually, that would be kind of over and above hours, but they would still meet the letter of the regulations. So that's my comment. And again, thank you so much for working on these. You're very welcome. All right, this is a moderator and I see no further requests for public comment. Madam Chair, would you like me to close the Q&A panel? Yes, please. Okay, it's closed. Okay, um, I see that, uh, I thought I saw, that, that um, Ms. Castro is here, but I don't know if her host speakers with her. Dr. Rajo, we're going to go to actually yeah. item 18 on the agenda next. Okay. Okay. All right. So we are going to move to item number 18. Um, this is the regulatory report uh, update review and possible action on board regulation packages. Um, I'd like to turn this over to Heather Oliveras uh, to lead this discussion. Good morning, board members. Heather Olivares, Legislation and Regulation Analyst for the board. Um, I have updates on two regulatory packages that um, have been going through the formal regulatory process with OAL. The first package is the fee regulations. The board initially posted this regulatory proposal for a 45 day comment public period on August 7th, 2020. And that posting starts the 1 year formal rulemaking process. With a deadline to submit the completed rulemaking package to OAL by August 6, 2021. We have already met that deadline. We submitted our package on August 7th, 2021. Normally, OAL has 30 working days to review and approve regulations. However, due to COVID-19, there is currently a waiver in place that extends this time frame to 120 days. So at this time, the board is still waiting for OAL to complete this review. The second package is the AB 2138 regulations. And the board initially posted this regulatory proposal for a 45 day comment period on March 6, 2020. Our deadline to submit the completed package to OAL was March 5th, 2021. Um, we did meet that deadline. And as Paul Sanchez previously announced, OAL recently approved this regulatory proposal and it was effective as of May 7th, 2021. So we have successfully completed um, this regulatory proposal and um, that is now current law. Are there any questions with my report? Looks like Paul has his hand up. Sorry, I need to take my hand down there. Thanks. Okay, are there any 
uh, questions from board members? Seeing none, um, do we have any uh, public comment on this um, update? Thank you, Madam Chair. I have opened up the Q&A panel. If any members of the public would like to comment on this agenda item, please type. I would like to make a comment using the field in the lower right-hand corner of your screen and submit it to all panelists. We are displaying instructions for your reference. All right, Madam Chair, I see no requests for public comment at this time. Shall I close the Q&A panel? Yes, thank you. Okay, it's been closed. Okay, we're going to do a little jumping around here again, um, trying to uh, meet our time certain at 11 o'clock for our guest speakers. So I'd like to move to item number 16 on the agenda. A discussion and possible action regard, regarding required professional experience, direct supervision requirements and remote or telehealth supervision. And I believe again, Heather Oliveros is going to lead this discussion. Correct. <laughs> um, the, the board reviewed and approved this regulatory proposal at the February 20th, 2020 meeting. However, in preparing the required regulatory documents in order to start the formal rulemaking process, Board staff identified necessary changes to the definition of required professional experience. Specifically, the current definition of required professional experience includes an inaccurate reference to the requirement for applicants to submit evidence of supervised professional experience. Additionally, the definition doesn't currently include a reference to business and professions code section 2532.25, which provides the licensure requirements for audiologists that became effective January 1, 20, 2008, when a um, doctorate degree became required for the practice of audiology. So I'd like you to look in your packet to um, the following pages after my memo, um, which has the changes to the regulatory text on page one. You'll see the required professional experience definition is being amended to mean the supervised practice of speech language pathology or audiology for the purpose of meeting the requirements for licensure in accordance with sections 2530.5 subdivision F 2532.2 subdivision C and 2532.25 subdivision B2 of the code and these regulations. And just to provide some context of what these sections are, the first section 2530.5 subdivision F authorizes the full scope of practice for RPEs practicing under the supervision of a speech language pathologist or audiologist. The second section 2532.2D was an inaccurate reference to the exam licensing requirements and instead we are amending this to reference the correct section with 2532.2C which is proof of supervised experience for speech language pathologists and audiologists um, prior to 2008. And then the new section being added 2532.25B2 requires proof of supervised experience for audiologists after 2008 when a doctoral, doctoral degree became required. So those are the changes um, on the following page two, you will see some additional text in red, um, but that's just referencing the sections of law that we're, we are um, referencing in making this regulation. That's basically our authority um, to make this regulation in the first place. So if there's any questions, I'm happy to answer them. 
Um, or if in reviewing the text, you see that there are additional changes that should be made, please bring them up. Um, otherwise, we do need a formal motion um, to approve this regulatory text. Can I ask for comments, questions from the board first? Seeing none, uh, I'd like to open this up for public comment. Thank you, Madam Chair. I have opened up the Q and A panel. If any member of the public would like to comment on this agenda item, please type. I would like to make a comment using the field in the lower right hand corner of your screen and submit it to all panelists. We are displaying instructions and we'll give you a moment. All right, this is a moderator. I see no requests for public comment at this time. Madam Chair, would you like me to close the Q&A panel? Yes, thank you. Okay, it's closed. Okay, I would like to uh, entertain a motion to accept um, these regulatory changes, excuse me, the technical changes to the regulatory language from, uh, yes, on the board. This is Todd. I move to accept the changes. Thank you. Is there a second? This is Holly. I second. Okay. Is there any further discussion? Hearing none, Sharice, could I impose on you to um, call the vote? Absolutely. Dr. Raju? Aye. Ms. Kaiser? Aye. Mr. Borges? Aye. Ms. Chang? Aye. Ms. Dominguez? Aye. Ms. Snow? Aye. Motion carries. Okay. Thank you, Heather. Um, I'm not sure where we're going just yet. Uh, we do have our um, two speakers in attendance at this point. Um, not sure if they're ready to go forward or if we should move on to another agenda item. Um, Paul? Yes, yes, Dr. Raju, we are ready now to go to item agenda item number 12. Okay, great. Um, all right, item number 12 is an overview of the disciplinary process, health quality enforcement section of Attorney General's office. And I believe um, Mr. Sanchez will introduce our speakers. Yes, um, we're we're very pleased to have with us today uh, two individuals who work very closely with the board in the area of enforcement. Um, as you all know, consumer protection is the highest priority of the board, and what we what the work that we do can sometimes lead all the way through the adjudication process into administrative discipline. Um, since I've come to the board, I have been working with Gloria Castro, who serves as a senior assistant attorney general uh, for the Department of Justice. And Gloria, um, you know, oversees a great deal of work uh, with consumer affairs. She has a very important job there. Um, she has been there um, for some time, and I, I believe in 2010, she was appointed by the then attorney general and now Vice President Kamala Harris. Um, Ms. Castro is the type of person that makes time to, um, to work with any issue that we might have. Um, she treats us as, you know, an important client in, in everything that we do. So we really appreciate working with her. In 2016, um, Rose Luzon came to the Department of Justice, having worked in the private sector, and even in the private sector, she did some consumer protection work. Since she's been um, with uh, DOJ, she took on the role, uh, one of her many jobs that, that she does, is she serves as a liaison to the Speech Language Pathology, Audiology, and Hearing Aid Dispensers Board. So we've just, we've talked to them in the past, and the, the 
Gloria has come in the past and presented with our DAG liaison. This is uh, going to be the first time that Rosemary Luzon presents to us, but we wanted them to provide us with an overview. This is a somewhat high level overview of the disciplinary process, but this is a good opportunity for us to ask questions of them and, and to learn uh, about what we do um, from their perspective and talk about the different roles. So without any further delay, I, I hand it over to them. Thank you so much for being with us. Thank you so very much, Paul, for that wonderful uh, introduction and everything you just said about me. Uh, I mirror back to you. This board is so lucky to have Paul at the helm. I do enjoy um, speaking to Paul uh, with a lot of frequency on all the important issues that are raised either in our cases through the public and through our esteemed board members. And so, without further ado, um, I will have Deputy Attorney General Luzon go ahead and present her slides. Uh, we will have an opportunity for questions at the end. And really, uh, it's my opportunity also to be able to answer any questions I can answer today. And to the extent I cannot, I will definitely uh, look forward to another invitation or relay that through your staff counsel and Paul for um, dissemination to the board. Um, in any respect uh, that you wish. Thank you very much, Paul. And again, we're very, we feel very, very lucky and honored to serve this board and your important mission. Thank you, Gloria. Thank you, Paul. Um, this is Rose Luzon, Deputy Attorney General. I am honored to be before all of you uh, this morning. Gloria and I are uh, immensely grateful for the opportunity to present this training to you on the disciplinary process. If I may ask for the opportunity to share my screen, I'll go ahead and uh, uh, upload the, uh, the PowerPoint slide. Thank you, Rosemary. This is the moderator and I will change your role to presenter. All right, you may now choose the option to share your screen. Thank you. Okay, I, I hope you all see the initial uh, slide of our presentation. It is uh, the overview of the disciplinary process. Uh, may I just uh, confirm that you are able to see it? Yes. Great, thank you. Okay, so I wanna start by giving all of you a brief roadmap of what we will be covering today during this training. We will begin and by providing an overview of the guiding principles and laws governing the board's enforcement and disciplinary work. Then we will move on to a discussion of the stages of the disciplinary process, from the investigation of possible unprofessional conduct, to the assessment of potential enforcement, to the filing of formal charges, and to the hearings and decisions that result. And finally, as Ms. Castro stated, we'll reserve time for any questions that you may have. I am endeavoring to move to the next slide. I don't know if there's a pause that you all are seeing there. Okay. You're good. Great, so Business and Professions Code, Section 2530. This is also known as a speech language pathologist and audiologist and hearing aid dispensers licensure act. Starting at Section 2530 until Section 2539.14, you will find the statutory laws that apply to speech language pathologists audiologists, and hearing aid dispensers. Foremost among these statutes is section 2531.02. This statute provides that public protection is the highest priority for the board in exercising its disciplinary and other functions. Importantly, it states 
whenever the protection of the public is inconsistent with other interests sought to be promoted, the protection of the public shall be paramount. In addition to the Business and Professions Code, there are additional authorities that guide the board's disciplinary functions. They include the California Code of Regulation and the board's disciplinary guidelines. For hearing aid dispensers, the applicable code of regulation can be found at Title 16, Division 13.3. There you will find the regulations that concern enforcement. For speech language pathologists and audiologists, the regulations pertain to enforcement are found at Title 16, Division 13.4. For all three licensee groups, the regulations instruct that the disciplinary guidelines shall be considered by the board in reaching its decision on discipline. The guidelines also instruct that it's appropriate for the board to deviate from the disciplinary guidelines in exercising its discretion if it finds that the particular facts of the case warrant deviation from the guidelines, such as, for example, if there are mitigating factors that are present. When considering the disciplinary guidelines, it is always important to keep in mind the dictates of Business and Professions Code Section 2531.02. That is, that public protection is the board's highest priority. This takes us to the disciplinary process and its various stages. The first stage is the investigation. The investigation is conducted by the Division of Investigation, also known as D of I, which is a division that falls within the Department of Consumer Affairs. The investigation begins when a complaint is received. It's then reviewed by the board staff and then referred to D of I for investigation. Evidence is gathered meaning documents are obtained, witnesses are interviewed, and the licensee who is the subject of the investigation is also interviewed. Once all relevant evidence is gathered, an expert is retained by the board. The expert's role is to objectively review the evidence and to provide an opinion as to whether or not unprofessional conduct has taken place. The next stage of the disciplinary process is the referral of the case to the Attorney General's office to conduct a legal review of the case. The Attorney General's office exists within the California Department of Justice. And within the AGO, there is our section, the Health Quality Enforcement Section. The Deputy Attorneys General otherwise known as DAGs within HQE, serve as the board's prosecutors. In the board's cases, we represent the complainant, who in our cases is the, the board's executive officer, Mr. Sanchez. Once the case is referred to the Attorney General's office, HQE undertakes the next step of the disciplinary process and that is to review and assess the evidence from a legal standpoint. The legal review stage is guided at all times by the standard of proof needed to establish unprofessional conduct. And that standard is clear and convincing proof. The party who carries the burden of proving the standard is the complainant. And the seminal case on the standard of proof in our cases is Ettinger. It's a California appellate court case from 1982 that still stands today. Ettinger underscores that the purpose of discipline in the context of professional licenses is public protection. And so when seeking to revoke suspend or impose other forms of discipline on the license, clear and convincing proof to a reasonable certainty is required to do so. 
Ettinger repeats this principle of public protection when it states that the purpose of an administrative proceeding concerning revocation or suspension of a license is not to punish the individual. The purpose is to protect the public from dishonest, immoral, disreputable, or incompetent practitioners. This legal standard of proof is the overarching principle that controls HQE's legal review and assessment of the case. Is there clear and convincing evidence to a degree of reasonable certainty to prove that the licensee committed unprofessional conduct? So, what does this standard mean relative to other legal standards of proof that we often hear about? While it's much stricter than the preponderance of evidence standard that's common in civil cases that seek a civil remedy, such as in malpractice cases. On the other hand, the clear and convincing standard is less onerous than the standard of proof in criminal cases, where the standard is beyond a reasonable doubt. Now, once the legal review step is completed and the determination is that there is clear and convincing evidence of unprofessional conduct, the next step is to prepare the accusation. The accusation is akin to the complaint in civil and criminal cases. In our administrative context, it's the formal pleading that gives notice to the licensee of the unprofessional conduct charges that are being brought against their license. And I'd like to say a brief word about statement of issues. This scenario arises when a person has applied for a license, the application is denied, and the applicant seeks to contest the denial. The statement of issues is therefore the formal pleading that gives notice to the applicant of the charges of unprofessional conduct that serve as the grounds for denying the license application. After the legal review stage, but before the public filing of a formal accusation, there are a few interim important steps worth noting. First, the DAG must make the recommendation to file an accusation. This is done by accepting the case for prosecution. Second, the DAG drafts the accusation, which entails identifying each charge of unprofessional conduct based on the evidence and setting forth in the accusation, the factual allegations that support the charge. The proposed accusation is then reviewed by a supervising deputy attorney general, also known as an SDAG. And once it is reviewed and approved by the SDAG, the accusation is then sent to the board's executive officer, who again is the complainant in our cases. The executive officer, Mr. Sanchez reviews the accusation, and if deemed acceptable, he will sign it. At that point, the accusation is served upon the licensee, who is now referred to in the accusation as the respondent, and the accusation is made public online on the Breeze website. Business and Professions Code Section 2533 sets forth the various grounds for unprofessional conduct that can be charged in an accusation. They include quality of care violations, such as gross negligence, repeated negligence, or incompetence. They also include past criminal convictions, fraud or deceit in the obtaining of a license, drug or alcohol-related conduct, such as the self-administration of controlled substances or the excessive or dangerous use of drugs, alcohol, or both, 
and they also include dishonest or fraudulent acts. Section 2533 also has additional grounds for unprofessional conduct, and they include acts that endanger public health, welfare, and safety, consumer-related conduct, such as false or misleading advertising or warranty violations, violations of terms and conditions imposed by the board for purposes of probation or conditional licenses. They include a hearing aid dispenser's unauthorized use of the term, to the terms doctor, physician, clinic, or audiologist. And they also include prior out-of-state discipline. For unprofessional conduct involving quality of care, it is important to keep in mind that the licensee's conduct is looked at relative to the standard of care for similarly situated practitioners. Specifically, the standard of care is the degree of care that a reasonably prudent practitioner would provide under the same or similar circumstances. Care that deviates from the standard to an extreme degree or to a simple degree of departure can constitute grounds for unprofessional conduct. And such deviation can give rise to charges of gross negligence, repeated negligence, or both based on the evidence. Once the accusation is filed, the case proceeds to litigation. And the next steps are discovery and possible re resolution of the accusation by way of settlement, default, or trial by hearing. We will know how the respondent wishes to proceed in the case because they are required to complete and submit a notice of defense within 15 days of being served with the accusation. Upon receipt of the respondent's notice of defense, the parties will then exchange what's called discovery. Essentially, that is all of the information concerning each side's case, such as documents or witness names. Then a hearing date for trial on the accusation will be set. Before the hearing date, a settlement may be reached to resolve the accusation. If that happens, a proposed settlement is then sent to the board for its consideration and, if appropriate, for adoption. But the settlement is not final and not public until and unless it is formally adopted by the board. There is a different path forward if no defense, notice of defense is submitted by the respondent. Where there is no notice of defense, the respondent has effectively waived their right to a hearing on the merits of the accusation. Alternatively, the respondent might submit a notice of defense, but then ultimately, for some reason, not appear at the hearing. In both scenarios, the case will then move to what's called a default proceeding. And that is where the board is statutorily authorized to take action based on the respondent's express admissions or upon other evidence and affidavits without having to give notice to the respondent. When the board renders its decision on default, the respondent will be served with a default decision and within seven days, the respondent may make a written motion to the board requesting that the decision be vacated. The board may then exercise its discretion in that situation to vacate the default decision and to grant respondent a hearing, but it may do so only upon a showing by respondent of good cause. If there is no settlement, if there is no default, then the parties will proceed to the hearing on the accusation. The hearing will take place before an administrative law judge at the Office of Administrative Hearings 
also referred to as OAH. The evidence will be presented to the ALJ, including all relevant documents, all witnesses, and the ALJ will then issue a proposed decision. That proposed decision is then sent to the board for its consideration. And the board may do a number of things. It may either adopt the ALJ's proposed decision it's in, in its entirety. It may reduce or increase the proposed penalty. The board may make minor or technical changes. It may reject the proposed decision and re remand it back to the ALJ to take additional evidence. Or the board may reject the proposed decision altogether. That's called a non-adoption. And in that situation, the board may decide the case upon the record, additional written statements made by the parties, and oral arguments. Afterwards, there may be additional litigation activity. And that may include a petition for reconsideration that's filed with the board, followed by a request for judicial review of the board's decision. So in sum, there are multiple ways to achieve resolution of the accusation, either by hearing, by settlement, or by default. In all of those instances, the result is a formal and final decision of discipline made by the board. So with that, uh, Cass Castro and I would be happy to take any questions uh, that you all might, might have. Would the board members have any questions? Hi, this is Holly. Uh, thank you so much for this um, presentation. Um, on your the second to last slide, disciplinary process, I wasn't sure of the acronym you gave. It was ALJ or AOJ. Can you define that again for me, please? Oh, absolutely, absolutely. And thank you for your question. ALJ stands for Administrative Law Judge. Thank you. Um, great. This is Marcia. Um, I'm not quite sure how to ask this, but I wonder if you could speak to something a little more nuanced than these exact rules for disciplinary process. Um, in my years on the board, I am looking at a number of cases. Um, a number of board members make comments such as, um, that doesn't seem so bad. I think I might have done that myself in the past. Um, so I don't think we should punish this person. Of course, that's not our role to punish, but to rehabilitate. So I think we should lessen any kind of uh, disciplinary um, uh, eventualities that we might impose. I was wondering if you could just speak to that in terms of how the board members should think about the cases that we look at in terms of that kind of thinking. Absolutely, I'm happy to do so. Thank you for that. Um, I think that the guiding print, it always goes back I think to the guiding principles and the guiding laws uh, that inform the board's disciplinary work. So first and foremost, I would go back to uh, the mandate statutorily that the board's highest priority is public protection. And so with that as sort of the overarching principle, then we have to look at the legal standard of clear and convincing proof. So that's the legal component of things as well as the guidance that's provided by the disciplinary guidelines. There, is, there are guidelines to be followed with the ability to provide discretion. I think that, uh, that at all times, those three pillars should um, uh, guide the board's decision making. And I think with that, it sort of insulates the process from subjectivity, from personal opinions, uh, and it takes it to more of an objective, um, necessarily objective, uh, uh, perspective and, and view of uh, how to carry out the uh, the work of discipline. Okay, thank you. Uh, 
Hi, this is Holly. I have another question. Um, at what point would a DUI trigger um, this process? Is it after the first one or after two that are close together? How does that work? Well, a, a DUI conviction period uh, gives rise under 25, section 2533 to a, a possible uh, charges of unprofessional conduct if there is if there is an actual conviction um, in in and so so a prior DUI in and of itself one or or multiple can itself give rise to it but it also can give rise to the other another charge of danger you know consuming alcohol or other substances uh, excessively uh, in in a way that endangers the licensee him or herself uh, others or the general public so the the existence of a conviction itself give rise gives rise to uh, a charge of unprofessional conduct regardless of how many thank you sure Are there any other questions from board members? I see Todd Borges. Hi, thank you. Um, can you speak at all to how the um, the decisions are made or the punishment, whether it's a three-year um, suspended license, a five-year, what type of um, guidelines do the um, judges use when determining how long of a suspension of a license? Uh, and thank you for that question as well. The, the guidelines um, that the judges or the ALJs are to follow are the same guidelines that the board must follow. And those are the disciplinary guidelines for the hearing aid, dis uh, hearing aid dispensers, as well as the guidelines for the uh, audiologists and speech language pathologists. So those are the, the, the guidelines that uh, all decision makers um, must follow the proposed decision makers, which would be the ALJs, as well as the final decision makers, which would be the board. And those guidelines are, are include the guidelines or the, the recommended or minimum and maximum uh, discipline that should be imposed uh, in depending on the charge. So those would actually be set forth in the guidelines themselves. That would be the, the, the controlling, uh, if you will, um, a guide for imposing discipline with, uh, as I mentioned earlier, the ability to exercise discretion. Uh, that would be the ability of the ALJ in a proposed decision context, as well as the board in a final decision context uh, to take into account using its discretion, uh, any factors that may either mitigate or aggravate the proposed uh, discipline in the case. Um, hi, this is, this is Karen. Um, thank you for doing this presentation. I was wondering, is there, is there somewhere written out like that has something like written out what type of guidelines there are. As an example, um, if you get a if if you get a speeding ticket, you know this is the exact fine that you would get. If you, you know, something like that, is there is there is there something written out for for situations like this? Not to that, not to my knowledge, in that specific sense. Um, right, so not anything that is specific to uh, specific facts or circumstances of a DUI in that, in your example. Um, but generally speaking, the guidance is in the disciplinary guidelines. It will, it will, it will say in the context of a criminal conviction or conduct that involves alcohol and drugs, there would be guidance there as to what the discipline should be. But again, it's guidance not requirements. So there's guidance as to what should be the minimal minimal discipline and what should be the maximal uh, maximum discipline. And and the board then 
is has the ability to take into account those facts that you, specific facts that you're talking about um, to determine whether or not those facts warrant a mitigation and deviation away from the guidelines or aggravation uh, of uh, you know, of the of the proposed discipline. But the guidelines um, are are really the the first uh, I think uh, guide or or reference point, benchmark, if you will, for determining what the appropriate discipline in the case is, then the actual specific facts and the circumstances are things that the board would then take into account in its assessment, exercising its discretion of what the, the, the discipline is at the end of the day. And then these uh, discipline guidelines are actually, they're in the board regs, correct? Um, the, they're actually they're actually uh, on the on the on the board's website available on the board's website, um, and so they they are they are referenced in the board's regs. Um, they're not actually set out in the board's regs, but they're referenced there as something that the board must consider when imposing discipline. And it also provides for the ability to exercise discretion in the imposition of discipline. So it's referenced in the regs, but they're actually you know. Uh, available, physically available on the board's website. Okay, thank you. Can I call on Debbie Please. Snow? Oh. Sorry, I didn't know who came first on the Amber's list. Hi, this is Debbie. Thank you for the presentation. I, it was great. Um, I did have a question that um, sometimes when we reject a decision and it goes back, um, sometimes we're concerned with the time lapse that the practitioner may still be practicing and it's delaying the decision. Um, but at the same time, it's very important to make sure we get it right. How, how do you weigh that situation? Is there something we should consider? I, th I think that's a, uh, you speak to a, a, a realistic, um, if you will, dilemma. Um, the board is looking to act expediently and, and uh, appropriately with respect to a decision on discipline. On the other hand, that's balanced against the need to provide for due process uh, and the need to provide for uh, the ability to for the, the licensee to have a hearing in due course or a rehearing in due course before there's any discipline that's exacted on that person's license since it is a property, right? And so you speak to, I think, a, a very important nuanced uh, issue um, that, uh, that, is, that is real and that's, I think, appropriately concerning. Um, I don't know from a practical standpoint uh, what more you can do in terms of facilitating um, the adjudication or the re-adjudication of that case. Uh, you've, you've done, the board has done its job by assessing it, by rejecting it, and by requiring for there to be uh, a hearing, if you will, on, that, on, the, on the, uh, the underlying charges. And so the, that process then just has to uh, uh, play itself out. Um, and and, and uh, from the AGO standpoint, well, we take it we take that responsibility seriously. Um, we will uh, set the, the matter for hearing if that's the next step that needs to happen uh, as soon as uh, we can. Um, we don't control the timing of that because there is the calendar of the administrative uh, court or the Office of Administrative Hearings. And so we can't dictate necessarily what that that uh, that timing is going to look like, but we, like the board, uh, act promptly and expeditiously so that there can be an appropriate adjudication of that of that case. But I think what you are, are noting is an important, um, uh, not not necessarily conflict, but but issue of balancing uh, balancing the the need to adjudicate the case uh, expeditiously uh, against. Uh, also, the uh, the uh, due process rights of the licensee to have his or her case uh, appropriately and fairly heard uh, in due course. Thank we we do have some interim um, actions that can be taken 
uh, such as Penal Code Section 23 uh, bail recommendations. That arises in the same context as the prior question that Ms. Chang had. To the extent an arrest um, has uh, relevance to the profession, uh, qualifications, functions, and duties, so a moral turpitude sort of uh, allegation or fraud, those are all things that we rely on licensees to be truthful and reliable in maintaining records um, that are very important for patients. So Penal Code Section 23 allows our deputies to make a special appearance on behalf of Paul Sanchez and the board uh, to be able to make a recommendation that restrictions be applied to the license to the extent it has a connection or a nexus uh, to protecting the public. Um, and while the guidelines and all that are uh, instructive and our knowledge of what it is that the qualifications, functions, and duties are of each of the professionals, it is oral argument to a criminal judge. To the extent there is a federal crime uh, that is being alleged against a practitioner, and most of those tend to be fraud, uh, we can write a letter to the USAA, the United States District, uh, Attorney, basically, and make a recommendation that uh, their licenses, license be restricted within the context of uh, any OR release, loan recognizance release, or bail recommendation. And then finally, another interim action that we seldom take advantage of, but when we do, it's very, very serious. And that is um, from time to time, our clients will become aware through usually colleagues that there are significant mental or organic or psychological or substance abuse issues that the practitioner has not self-identified or the peers are too fearful to bring up or sometimes it's an employee of the practitioner. So those are all very sensitive issues. We take those seriously. If they do not voluntarily agree, then we will take other actions to examine. Uh, it's a very, very serious inquiry. But again, it's, it's public protection and, and those things tend to be outside of our direct scope with the board. But ultimately, once those things are either proven to be factors that should come to the board's um, attention, they can be reduced into an accusation or a surrender or something else uh, that protects the public. Okay, thank you very much. Yes, sometimes there can, there's a concern that the public is um, in danger while the time is passing. So that's that's what I was, thank you for answering that. And especially with um, some of our populations um, that are older, uh, we have a critical interest in trying to capture that testimony as, as, soon, as soon as we can and as close as possible to the events in question. So we have an interest to preserve that evidence or those memories. And so that's when we hear from Paul directly. Um, our liaison's always available on an ad hoc basis to field any question, as am I. And we will find um, a way to manage that concern as quickly as possible. But like um, Dag Luzon has um, discussed, it is a property right. There are due process. Uh, considerations, but when something is very serious, this, all boards are empowered through your health and safety and welfare powers that are delegated to you from the people of the state of California that we undertake those on your behalf to protect the public and the consumers and ultimately the licensees themselves, right? Some licensees don't have introspection sometimes to limitations, whether they're imposed by drug abuse, um, age or health or stress. Thank you. That really helped. Hey, Paul, did you have a question or a comment? I just had a comment. I, I just wanted to clarify uh, for the board members who are asking about our disciplinary guidelines. Um, those are included in our Practice Act law books, depending on which law book you're using. It's Appendix A and B, and it's at the back of the law book. This also gives context to some future work that we're going to be doing in 
renewing and revising those disciplinary guidelines. It's, it's a lot of work um, for those of you that have done it. And uh, now you can see just how important that work is. I just wanted to mention that those disciplinary guidelines are in our law book. Thank you. And Gilda, did you have a comment or question? Yes, oh, just a comment. Um, thank you for the presentation. And um, I just wanted to um, uh, thank you and, and tell you that I appreciated the clarity that was provided regarding the board's uh, role regarding the considerations such as adopting the, the ALJ decision and or reducing or increasing a penalty, which I can see um, would, would um, happen during any of our discussions, um, suggesting those technical changes that can be made or rejecting the proposed um, decision. Um, and and uh, at least in part or in totality. So thank you for the information. You're welcome. Yes, thank you for inviting us. Um, thank you, uh, Paul. I was just wondering if this would be a time when you would like to um, discuss the process in terms of um, suspending <clears throat> a license to practice while some aspect of adjudication is occurring. Is this an appropriate time to talk about that? Yes, and actually, uh, Gloria just touched on that. Um, Gloria, I believe you talked about the PC23 process. Um, yeah. Is there anything else that you might want to share with the board? I think it's important to understand we've had some, we've had instances where we've um, exercised the P3, PC23 process and Maybe you could just uh, expand on that in interim suspension orders so that everyone understands Absolutely. that. So, uh, you know, and there, there's some discussion always in the press um, about the subjugation of different interests that the public has in protecting itself from predators or licensees or other folks who are not in compliance with the law. Um, oftentimes, even though this board, these boards have uh, concurrent jurisdiction to proceed on some criminal aspects of the health and safety and welfare regulations and laws that are under your preview, preview to accuse someone of, um, oftentimes those can have a parallel track in a criminal context, um, such as in the example that I cited where someone is caught uh, you know, as a defendant uh, in a Medicare pro program fraud investigation that results in charges. Um, in cases like that, whether they're state um, or federal, and on the state hand, it would be the Bureau of Medicare Fraud and Elder Abuse. Um, they preserve a lot of the Californians' interest in making sure that Medi-Cal funds are used to the best uh, possible way and are not uh, subject to fraud. To the extent someone is caught up in something like that, um, and we can see that it's relevant to the qualifications, functions, and duties of their profession, then we can go into court. Uh, we will find a de deputy attorney general to quickly look at the case, contact the de deputy district attorney or um, U.S. attorney, have a discussion with them, and pop in to the criminal court on behalf of Paul Sanchez and this board to give advice to the criminal court judge. Sometimes, uh, depending on the seriousness, let's say it's a sexual abuse or predatory um, type of practice uh, or allegation, um, like as in audiology, if uh, somebody's accused of molesting a child, um, even though it's not the child uh, that is a patient, we would be able to connect that back to protecting the public. In a case like that, we might get a restriction of the license. Only this board has the ability to suspend, but a criminal court can restrict the individual from using their license. And we usually can get that during the pendency of the criminal court hearing. If we can, we will file a placeholder accusation and wait for the criminal case to go first. It does result in some economies such that um, they go first and their punishment hopefully will result in a lack of liberty 
and our punishment goes second, which results in the lack of uh, them being able to use their property interest for a stream of income in their profession. Um, when we manage cases like that, it works out really well. We can go ahead and charge on an arrest if we have enough, do a placeholder accusation. This board, these boards do not have statute of limitations, so we're not really worried about that, but it's nice to be able to put something on notice because where there's one potential victim or one potential act that could impart more patient complaints, then it actually invites patient complaints to this board and then we have more than what the criminal case has and we can maybe operate on a parallel track with any patients that have nothing to do with the criminal case and then get rid of the licensee that way. At the same time, um, if they're convicted, then that is usually a discussion where we're asking them to surrender their license or they result in defaults, which is um, very common. That the person has stopped their, their funds, they, they know that they're not going to be hired and they just don't file a notice of defense and we can get a default and they may come back to try and get back into the profession and then it's up to you um, to decide that. Um, Yesterday, you heard a penalty relief um, application. That, that's where you would see that person again, potentially for a petition on reinstatement of their license. On the second part, on interim suspension orders, those are very serious. Uh, those are prosecuted under Government Code Section 11529. Those require a showing that all things being equal, the uh, administrative law judge would serve the public by going ahead and suspending the license in the interim of an accus accusation case being resolved. The rub there is that they have a right essentially to a speedy resolution of the accusation matter. And what that means is that when we file an interim suspension order and request the suspension of the license, due process rights allow them to have that case heard as soon as possible. Why? Well, because we have suspended the property right on good evidence, but they have not had their full day in court. Uh, an interim suspension order um, results after a very perfunctory hearing based on declarations and not live testimony. And our DAG's really great and they win these. Um, but they, that also means they have to be ready to go within a very short amount of time. So if you have all your decks in a row, you have your experts, you have your victims, you probably can go to hearing very quickly. But it's a balance there. We want to make sure that when we file these interim suspension orders, we're ready to go if the, if the respondent wants to have their accusation matter heard as quickly as possible. And they do sometimes go down that track. Uh, other times they don't and they go ahead and agree that they're going to be suspended and they take their time to have their day in court under accusations. And last and not least, um, Department of Consumer Affairs uh, healthcare licensees have a very powerful tool in their tool chest and that is Business and Professions Code Section 820 at SAC. And that is the, um, those are the statutes that deal with mental illness. Um, whether organic or caused by uh, substance abuse or just substance abuse straight out. Um, those are the statutes that uh, require that we be able to ask that somebody be ordered to be examined. They can also volunteer. That is uh, somewhat rare sometimes, but sometimes people are interested in volunteering to be examined. Um, at the end of the day, uh, it's a forensic examination conducted by an expert in that field of psychiatry or whatever it is that uh, we are looking at this person for. And based on what they say, then um, we would be able to apply a prosecutorial discretion to that and see where we go with it. And normally we would file an accusation if the ultimate conclusion is that the person is unsafe to practice. The harder ones are, you know, alcohol abuse cases. Uh, that is a recognized um, substance abuse issue, but sometimes uh, an expert, after discussing this issue and examining 
the licensee can decide that with treatment, they are safe to practice. And that's where rehabilitation and public protection um, kind of meet. And um, ultimately, we bring these important decisions to you, the board, to decide what to do with. So hopefully that answered the, uh, some of the interim actions that we can take to protect the public as soon as possible. Okay, um, I don't know if you wanted to add anything to that, uh, Paul. Thank you for yeah. that explanation. You know, ju just one other thing, and I, I probably don't want to get too uh, far into this discussion, but the board also has the ability, when someone violates a practice act, we have the ability to file an injunction with the California Superior Court. And we've also worked with the Attorney General's office and have been successful in doing this um, or reaching settlements in the process of doing this. So that's also that's right. an avenue that we have. I don't know if you want to touch on that yeah. at all, Gloria. Oh, of course, I'd, I'd love to. Business and Professions Code Section 17500 uh, has a long and storied history in California. They're essentially private attorney general actions. Um, and they call them that because initially only the attorney general could enjoin these types of practices that are, um, and there's like about seven different um, markers of such a violation of law. But basically anything unfair, uh, unlawful, and specifically with 17500, it's advertising. So the state of California is very interested to make sure that. Um, Entities such as these boards are able to go into civil court and enjoin violations of law, specifically in advertising that is calculated to defraud people. I have had the pleasure of prosecuting those on behalf of the office, and this board, more than many others, um, has these types of issues arise from time to time where it's blatantly clear that there is a full page ad in a newspaper advertising something that for those of us that are in the know just appear to be false. Yep. Um, we don't just go on our gut, we do show it to somebody, an expert or someone that can give us an opinion on whether or not what is being promised is not truthful misleading, false, untrue. And um, these enjoin enjoining actions can be very powerful and they can lead to civil penalties. And um, fortunately, the other aspect of actions like this is that while they are very work intensive, they are calculated to not only stop the behavior through an injunction given by a judge, but are also calculated to uh, operate as a cautionary tale for any other uh, folks who may have wanted to mislead the public and entice them into buying something that is too good to be true. Thank you, Paul. I, I, we do do that in thinking of one case in particular in my head, but yes, very important tool. And thank you, Ms. Dominguez, for, for that question. Uh, Gilda, did you have another question? Sorry, I took my hand down. Okay. Are there any other questions or comments from board members? Actually, I have a, I have a question. Mm -hmm. um, actually, just to the point you just made concerning uh, the illegal advertising. Um, I know one of the uh, potential punishments for that, one of the potential um, Disciplinary guidelines is that they take a, they take the written exam, which uh, including license law. And I know this is something that came up in the not too distant uh, past. And then when you look at the disciplinary guidelines in the book, it basically says that essentially they're going to have to retake the written exam, as it's already written. Unfortunately, in the written exam, there there really aren't any questions about license law. So I'm not 
understanding necessarily how the disciplinary guideline actually meets the needs of that particular issue. And, and that is a, a good point to make, and, I, uh, and I'll dovetail into what Mr. Sanchez has um, discussed. The disciplinary guidelines are a good opportunity for you to agendize that for further discussion, because if the actual test is no longer meeting that, then you can redraft that and have it go through your regulatory and public hearing process. Uh, that includes everyone that's impacted in addition to consumers. If it's illusory and it's not calculated to improve the person or rehabilitate or prevent future harms, then that is something we would encourage you to look at, Mr. Borg and board member. Hi, can I add to that? Um, just that, yes, I agree. It's something that we need to look at um, when we're looking at our disciplinary guidelines, but I would also caution the board to understand that the examination is also a changing document and that we don't necessarily know what is or what isn't on that written examination due to exam security. Well, actually, that's not 100% true, Paul, because you can go on to our website and it lists an outline of everything to study for the written test. Um, that, fairly, that is true that, right that is true that's a guidance document but the actual but the actual questions of the written exam themselves we don't know and i think that the purpose of that particular guideline is to ensure competence and that's the way that the board at that time saw to do that so when we are reviewing our disciplinary guidelines that's something that we can review as a board Okay, are there any further comments or questions from board members? Seeing none, I'd like to ask if there is any public comment or questions at this time. Thank you, Madam Chair. I am opening up the Q&A panel. If any member of the public would like to comment on this agenda item, please type. I would like to make a comment using the field in the lower right hand corner of your screen and submit it to all panelists. We are displaying instructions for your reference and we'll give you a moment. This is a moderator. I see no requests for public comment at this time. Would you like me to close the Q&A panel? Yes, thank you. All right, it's closed. Okay, um, it is about quarter to 12. And um, I would like to first thank the, um, our two guest attorneys today for this uh, really helpful uh, presentation. Um, and it was very interesting and, uh, and it may actually engender further questions down the road. So uh, hopefully we can uh, filter those through uh, Mr. Sanchez to you, but thank you again for being here today. And thank you very much for inviting us. We are at, at your service. And again, we're very privileged and honored to help you do your important work. And um, we really have a lot of respect for board members that use your extra time to do such an important function that is is difficult at times. So thank you very much for all that you do. Yes, we're very grateful to you too as a resource. We uh, couldn't do our jobs without you. So uh, thanks so much. Um, as I mentioned, it, it is about quarter to 12 and the next item on our agenda is, could be uh, somewhat lengthy. So I think we might take a somewhat early lunch at this point. Um, last time we did about a, a 45 minute lunch. Hopefully that is uh, acceptable to everybody. So approximately 1230, 1235 perhaps. That sounds good to return at 1235. Yes. Thank you. Okay. Thank you.
I'd like to welcome everyone back from lunch. Um, we do have still a number of items to complete today. However, it looks like we might be ending early. Um, so let's get started with um, uh, item agenda item number 14, the legislative report update review and possible action on proposed legislation. Um, I would like to turn this over to Heather Oliveras. Excuse me, Dr. Rajo. Yes. But before we move forward, can we just do a quick check in if we haven't already, just to make sure that everybody's back? All the oh, I, okay. Back. Yeah, I guess because their name is on the list doesn't mean they're actually here. Um, yeah, can I just call roll? Yes, please. Okay. Um, Holly Kaiser? Here. Todd Borges? Here. Karen Chang? Here. Gilda Dominguez? Here. Debbie Snow? Here. Okay, it looks like all board members are here. Okay, so if is Heather here? Yes, I am here and I'm ready whenever everyone else is. Okay, I think everyone is here. I think we can start. Okay, good afternoon, uh, board members and the public attending. I am going to give an overview of legislation that board staff has been looking at so far this year. I'm going to start with um, the legislative calendar. We just passed the deadline for the last day for policy committee to meet and report bills in the House of Origin. So what that means is any bill that has not been heard in its first policy committee will be considered a two year bill at this point and not moving forward this year. Another upcoming date is May 21st. That's the last day for fiscal committees to meet and report bills in the House of Origin. And then by June 4th, every bill needs to be passed out of this House of Origin. Um, then the process will repeat itself in the second house with a deadline of July 14th to hear bills in the second policy committee and a last day for fiscal committees to hear bills in the second house is August 27th. We have a number of legislation legislative bills to look at um, for this year. Um, but I just want to give a reminder that the board can adopt a position on any legislation that has been noticed in this agenda and the possible positions the board can adopt are support, support if amended, oppose, oppose unless amended, or choose to just watch the bill. Um, board staff have included in the report recommended positions, but I just want to put out a reminder that any board member can entertain a motion for any of those um, positions I just went over, um, as well as members of the public can request that the board adopt a specific position on legislation. So if everyone is open to their report, the first bill on our list is a board sponsored legislation. And it is AB 435. This is the locked hearing aids bill that um, we have spent the past couple years developing the legislation and it is currently going through the process. This bill passed in the assembly without any formal opposition and has now been referred to the Senate Business Professions and Economic Development Committee. Um, to begin its process in the second house. A reminder of what this bill does, it requires hearing aid dispensers and dispensing audiologists to provide a purchaser with a written notice if the hearing aid being purchased uses proprietary or locked programming software. The written notice must be signed by the purchaser and the licensee must retain a copy consistent with current record requirements. The bill has um, earned support from our stakeholders, including the California Academy of Audiology, the California Speech Language Hearing Association, and Hearing Healthcare Providers of California, 
and the East Bay Chapter of the Hearing Loss Association of America. So since the board is already um, the sponsor of this legislation, we don't need to take an additional position, but if there are any questions, I'm happy to answer them. Looks like none. I have a question. Yes. Um, this it's probably not in this um, bill. However, as a as just a informational, if you would know, if you would be able to answer this, um, with these notices, are they translated in different languages? Say, for example, um, an hearing aid office in Alhambra, which has a very high proportion of Asian Asian clients or Asian a high Asian population, would there be translation in say like Chinese and Vietnamese? Or if say this is in Bakersfield or Fresno, will there be translation in Spanish? So at this, at this time, um, there is not any requirement for um, the notification to be translated. Um, it's certainly something the board can discuss. And um, the issue has also been discussed with assembly member Mullen's office already. Um, so it is possible as the bill moves through the Senate, we may see some discussion around um, perhaps translating it in Spanish. Um, but at this time, there is no requirement in the bill language. Okay. Would you offhand know if there's like a general rule or regulation or a law that says that um, any of these things have not just hearing aids, anything has to be translated um, in the appropriate language of that general population that that lives there. Because I understand you, I mean you can't translate everything, but in the general population where, you know, where these clusters of ethnicities live. I am not aware of a general overarching rule like that. I think um, it would be more at the discretion of the providers if they wanted to offer that service. Okay, great, thank you. I would just add to that that um, currently the thinking on this particular uh, disclosure is that it would become part of the delivery receipt, which is a standard requirement for all hearing aid sales. And as far as I know, those are not required to be in other languages, although I think it's it's a timely issue uh, for the board to start looking at or the DCA in general to start looking at in terms of this requirement. Yes, I would agree with that. And I think in drafting this legislation, the goal was to help keep the notification language itself relatively short. So it can fit on those existing documents. Are there any other questions about this bill in particular? Heather, do you want to ask for um, public comment on it? Oh, yes, please. So if there are no other uh, board comments or questions, I'd like to open it up to the public to uh, ask their questions. All right. This is a moderator. Thank you, Madam Chair. I have opened up the Q&A panel. If any member of the public would like to make a comment on this item, please type. I would like to make a comment using the field in the lower right-hand corner of your screen and submit it to all panelists. We'll give you a moment. This is the moderator. I see no request for public comment at this time. Shall I close the Q&A panel? Yes, thank you. You're welcome. Okay, Heather, would you like to proceed? Yes, so the next proposal on our report is um, a proposal that would have modified the 12 month professional experience requirement for licensure to allow students to count hours from clinical experiences or rotations occurring prior to the required professional experience. 
professional experiences combined with the RPE experiences to meet the licensing requirement. Um, the board was exploring including this bill in the business and professions omnibus bill. Um, however, it was not included and will now be included as part of the board sunset review process in 2022. Are there any questions about this proposal? Okay, not seeing any board comments. Um, there may be some uh, public comment, however, or questions. Uh, can I open it up to that? Thank you, Madam Chair. The question and answer panel is now available. If any member of the public has a question, please type. I would like to make a comment using the field in the lower right hand corner of the screen and submit it to all panelists. All right, this is a moderator. I see no requests for public comment at this time. Shall I close the Q and a panel? Yes, thank you. You're welcome. Okay, the next bill on the report is a B 486. This bill is currently on the assembly appropriation suspense file. Um, this is a education omnibus. Bill that includes a number of provisions, um, but a specific provision um, related to the practice of speech language pathology um, regarding the assessment of a pupil's language and speech disorders in school settings. Specifically, this provision will update terminology to require a speech language pathologist to determine that a pupil's difficulty in understanding or using spoken language results from speech sound disorder, voice disorder, fluency disorder, language disorder, or hearing impairment or deafness. Um, board staff is recommending that we watch this bill, um, and this provision of the bill is sponsored by Kesha and is designed to bring the education code up to date. This provision is li limited in scope to only apply to speech language pathologists practicing in elementary and secondary schools. Are there any questions about this one? Hi, this is Holly Kaiser. Um, I have a comment and that is that um, I had worked on the language of this when, you know, it, prior to being on the board, on the license board, <coughs> excuse me. And when I saw this, in our binder, I noticed an error in the wording um, where it says using spoken language. Spoken is supposed to be struck out because speech pathologists work with symbolic language, written language, and spoken. So I contacted um, Kasha to show the, to let them know I noticed that error. And I understand uh, a couple days ago that an amendment was being put in to modify to to um, to strike the that word. But I just wanted to let you know that. Okay, yeah, at this time, um, as of yesterday, the amendment was in print, but yeah, it takes a couple days when there are amendments to, for them to be shown mm -hmm. in okay. print. Thank you. Are there any other board comments, questions? Okay, can we ask for public comment? Thank you, Madam Chair. The QA Q and A panel is now available. If any member of the public would like to make a comment, please type. I would like to make a comment and submit it to all panelists. All right, this is a moderator. I see no requests for comment. Shall I close the Q&A? Yes, thank you. All right. And Heather, just making sure that um, if, in, with the watch position, we don't need a motion on that. That's correct. Okay, would you like to go ahead then? Yes, the next bill is AB 555, which is regarding assistive 
technology devices for special education. This bill is currently in the assembly education committee. It was not heard in its first policy committee, so this will be a 2 year bill. This bill will authorize a local education agency or special education local plan to retain, sell, or dispose of an assistive technology device, including hearing aids, if the market value of the device is less than $5,000 and it is not needed for another individual with exceptional needs. Um, we are recommending an opposed and less amended position um, because we have some concerns um, regarding the language of authorizing a school district to sell or fit or retain a hearing aid um, because if it's provided to another student, the hearing aid will need to be fit to that student. And this bill does not specify that a hearing aid must be fit by a licensed hearing aid dispenser, dispensing audiologist, or school personnel holding an appropriate credential. I have spoken with the author's office on this bill, um, and they said their intent is that students who have been provided with an assistive technology device will be allowed to keep the device when they age out of the education system. However, the current language is so broad by also authorizing them to sell a hearing aid. There is um, a code section in business and professions code, which is section 2530.5 that states the practice of speech language pathology or audiology cannot be restricted or prevented when performing when performed by school personnel holding a credential from the CTC. However, this bill will expand the scope of this ex exemption. Specifically, this bill will authorize school personnel with a CTC credential to retain, sell, or dispose of hearing aids rather than simply providing them. So are there any questions about this? Any other board questions or comments? Not seeing none. I'd like to verify um, that since this is an opposed unless amended, we do need a motion on this one. And the notion was to um, move that motion prior to public comment. Is that the case, Paul? Yes, that is correct. We'd get a, we would have a motion and a second. Okay, I'd, I would entertain a motion <clears throat> to oppose unless um, unless amended um, AB 555. This is Holly. I move to oppose unless amended AB 555. Do we have a second? This is Karen. I second. Do we have any other board discussion before we ask for public comment? Okay, seeing none, I'd like to ask for public comment before we vote. Thank you, Madam Chair. I have opened up the Q&A panel. If any member of the public would like to make a comment, please type. I would like to make a comment and submit it to all panelists using the field in the lower right-hand corner of your screen. This is the moderator. I see no request for public comment. Would you like me to close the Q&A panel? Yes, thank you. You're welcome. Okay, so I think, uh, Sharice, we can move forward with a, um, uh, to um, call the vote. Absolutely. Dr. Raggio? Aye. Ms. Kaiser? Aye. Mr. Borges? Aye. Ms. Chang? Aye. Ms. Dominguez? Aye. Ms. Snow? Aye. The motion carries. 
Thank you. Okay, Heather, do you want to proceed? Yes. Um, the next bill is AB 1361, which deals with expulsions and suspensions in preschools. Um, this bill is currently in the Assembly Appropriations Committee. This bill will require specific actions to be taken prior to disenrolling or suspending a child due to a behavior issue and will require the use of a suspension or expulsion only as a last resort in responding to a child's behavior. There is one provision that we are concerned about in this bill that would authorize a person with at least a master's degree in speech and language pathology to provide early childhood mental health consultation services. We are recommending a pose and less amended position um, because this provision authorizes a person with at least a master's in speech and language pathology to provide mental health services. Um, it doesn't even specify that the person must be licensed or hold a credential, only that they have a master's degree and two years of experience working with children zero to five years of age. Additionally, this bill defines early child mental health consultation services as a mental health service that develops the capacity of programs to serve and benefit a child enrolled in a child care and development program. Mental health services are outside of the scope for speech language pathology. Um, this bill also has a similar provision um, for occupational therapy. Um, so I have spoken with their board and they do plan to discuss this bill as well at their next board meeting. Are there any questions about this one? Can I ask if, if you know who's in support of this um, bill? Are there any professional organizations in support of it? Um, not related to us. Um, there are a number of school districts in support the California Association of Black School Educators, the California Charter Schools Association, and the National Association of Social Workers. There is no known formal opposition at this time. Um, and I have spoken with the Board of Psychology and the Board of Behavioral Sciences, um, who their licensees would have to oversee um, speech language pathologists acting in this thing, in this um, format, and they do not plan to bring this bill to their board. Okay, any other um, board members with questions or comments? So with this, you're recommending um, for us to oppose unless amended and to remove um, basically speech language pathology in the criteria. Correct. We don't have concerns with the overall bill. It's very much outside of the scope of our practice. Um, our concern is specifically with the one provision. So our amendment would simply be just to strike out um, the speech language pathology from it. Did you ask the author or the staff staff from the author's office um, why they included speech language pathology? So they just basically included everybody who services this age group. But it's not recommending that any other of these disciplines provide mental health consultations. Well, occupational therapy is included as there as well, which is outside of the scope of occupational therapists as well, which is why their board will also be discussing this bill. Mm -hmm. I would think there might be others. Okay. Okay, is there any other um, board comment? Seeing none, I'd like to ask for a motion 
uh, to oppose uh, unless amended um, this bill, AB 1361. I motion to the board to um, take an oppose less amend, uh, unless amended position on AB 1361. That's Karen. Todd, second. second. Todd, second. Um, yes. Is there any? Thank you. Uh, is there any other uh, board discussion before we seek um, public comment? Hi, this is Holly. Um, I think the one thing that comes to mind is that um, the speech pathologist and OT and others would be um, important as a member of a team. Um, in many cases, when we're talking about mental health, so I'm, I guess I'm wondering if that was the intent, and if so, when we oppose this, are do you see that there will be a way of making sure that we're recognized as um, participants on a team when needed? I think we can definitely point out um, the role that they play. However, the language is still problematic in that it doesn't even require a license in how it's currently written. I totally agree. I don't think by striking it out with how it's currently worded will take away the role of speech language pathology. I think it will just make it so they're not becoming a mental, you know, not providing a mental health service that's outside of the scope. Okay, if there isn't any other board um, discussion, I'd like to open the um, the opportunity for uh, the public to participate to ask questions. Thank you, Madam Chair. I have opened up the question and answer panel. If any member of the public would like to comment, please type. I would like to make a comment using the field in the lower right hand corner of your screen and submit it to all panelists. All right, we have an individual identified as Michelle that would like to make a comment. Uh, Michelle, I'll let you know when you've been unmuted. You'll have three minutes and I'll give you a 30 second warning. Michelle, you've been unmuted. Thank you. I, I have a question. Um, if is the language written because um, the team members that would make that determination are child care providers in this preschool setting, um, we're, we're licensed and I think that in terms of as speech language pathologists, the only commentary we could offer, and again, it's not outside of our scope to, if we know a client to talk about their executive function or impulsivity um, and some of those things that we that we may encounter because we know this person or, or we've been treating this person. And so exclusion from, the, from that, from this language, I, I understand why it's problematic, but there has to be some sort of language that encompasses our ability to participate or at least opine in our professional um, sense uh, sensibility about this person that they are going to make this de determination on. Um, and so I guess the clarification that I need is, you know, the, when the author uh, wrote it and if they made it so lax is that to open it up to, you know, preschool teachers and those others that are on the team that are not licensed, um, you know, I, I guess that's, that's, that's my question. And I guess the comment or the request would be that the amended language um, does reflect our ability to participate in that conversation. I yield my time. All right, yeah. this is, oh, sorry. Oh, I was just gonna say there were no further public comments. Heather, do you wanna to respond to that though? Yes, I think um, by striking the problematic language, it doesn't, diminish a speech language pathologist role as part of um, servicing a child. Um, it's just that the way they 
structured what they're defining as a mental health provider is problematic. And so I think when I convey to them our concerns, I can say our mate, you know, I can outline that our concern is only with how it is written currently, not with the role that speech language pathologists play and kind of leave it up to them if they want to revamp their whole language to make it a team that is providing a service. But right now, the way they structured it is there's going to be oversight by people licensed as mental health providers, um, which is within the scope like psychologists and other um, licensed clinical social workers. And it seems like that's the direction they want to go. They want to create a hierarchy, so to speak, of mental health providers. So it's sort of a challenge when taking a position and communicating with the author is we don't want to force them to take their bill in a direction just for our benefit, so to speak, but rather than outlying these are our concerns and this is what's problematic with it. If you choose to restructure your bill, then of course we're not going to have concerns with it as long as a speech language pathologist is not practicing outside of their scope. Hopefully that makes sense. Okay, are there any other um, public comments? Thank you, Madam Chair. There are no further requests for public comment. Would you like me to close the Q&A panel? Yes, please. Okay, it's closed. Thank you for that explanation, Heather. Um, so we have a motion uh, in front of us uh, to oppose unless amended AB uh, 1361. Sharice, would you like to call the vote? Absolutely. Dr. Raggio. Aye. Ms. Kaiser. Aye. Mr. Borges. Aye. Ms. Chang. Aye. Ms. Dominguez. Aye. Ms. Snow. Aye. The motion carries. Okay, the next bill on our list is AB 1236. This bill is currently on the Assembly Appropriations Committee suspense file. This bill will require healing arts boards to request specified workforce data from its licensees at the time of electronic application for a license and license renewal, or at least biannually from a scientifically selected random sample of licensees. The board will be required to report the data collected on a biennial basis and post it on the board's website. The board will also be required to provide the data annually to the Office of Statewide Health Planning and Development. The purpose of this bill is to use the data collected to identify and address disparities in the workforce so the state can have a greater sense of the workforce shortage needs and conduct more targeted outreach st strategies. However, since our board is currently on an old IT system, we do not have the capability to collect the data required by the bill at this time. So we would need to do this manually. Um, board staff would need to change all the application forms for each license type to collect this data and develop a form to be sent with the renewal reminder notices to collect this information every renewal cycle. This will significantly increase the board's workload, at least until we can get our new IT system in place. Um, so we are recommending that we take an opposed position at this time, um, just because of the costs and the workload to board staff. I'm just wondering, is, is this something that the business modernization project will uh, undertake to help us support? I think, our, 
Oh, sorry. Go ahead, Sharice. Sorry, this is Sharice. I, I don't think that the business modernization per se is intended to do something like this, but the business modernization makes it easier to add on a healing arts uh, survey to a renewal um, or to an online application where after they've finished the renewal, the, the next button goes to whatever survey that they can fill out if they want to, and then it collects it all into one central repository. So this is something more doable in the future. Um, but it's definitely something that would be really difficult for us to do now. Okay, I'm uh, oh, sorry, Heather, go ahead. Yeah, other boards that are also um, on older IT systems are also um, taking either a pose or a pose unless amended positions on this bill. So we would we are not the only board with this concern. Um, but it's more of a concern for boards with the old IT system versus boards that are on Breeze that can more easily um, adapt their database to collect this information. That's helpful to know. Are there any other comments or questions from board members? Um, this is Karen. Do you know what other boards, what their oppose or amend would sound like? Yeah, the Board of Pharmacy um, adopted a pose and less amended position, and their amendment was for the Office of Statewide Health and Planning and Development to actually collect the data um, because their IT system can't either. Um, and their offer was they would put a notice in their renewals to point um, the licensees to go to whatever source Oshped develops to collect the data. Can we do something like that similar? Or? Yeah, of course. Would it create more work for for the board? So we would still have the cost to develop the form and um, potentially increased mailing costs for our renewals. Um, and I think maybe Sharice can speak more to what our renewal looks like right now, um, but it is possible there could be some increased costs with and that direction as well. This is Sharice. It, it would include increased costs. Um, mailers usually add a a uh, small inter incremental uh, increase, of course, is, is just like a um, hearing aid dispenser, the, the forms that are required as we slowly add more and more, they get longer with more pages. So they cost more to mail out and they also cost more um, in, in postage. Um, the other thing being as we, as we move more to online renewals, um, many boards are moving towards postcard reminders to renew so that the board isn't spending so much money on mailing and on on copying and, and postage for all these renewals um, as we get more people into online renewals. So um, it's something to think about. Um, you can always redirect and say impose unless amended and hey, have those guys do it. Um, but I mean, it's, it's kind of neither here nor there if, if that's the route you would like to take. But anytime we're gonna add something to our renewal, um, it does have an incremental cost increase, of course. Um, Unless it's it's straight up in an online renewal, which we we won't have as much um, ability to work with until we're further into the business modernization process. So, okay. thank you. Mm -hmm. Are there any more board questions or comments? Seeing none, um, I'd last like to ask for a motion. Uh, to oppose uh, AB 1236 before we go to public comment. I move to oppose AB 1236. Do I have a second? Uh, I second the motion. This is Holly. If there isn't any other uh, or further board discussion, or is there? 
If not, I'd like to open this up to uh, public comment. Thank you, Madam Chair. I have opened up the Q&A panel. If any member of the public would like to make a comment, please type. I would like to make a comment using the field in the lower right-hand corner of your screen and submit it to all panelists. And I do see we have a comment from Brian Clifford. So, Brian, I'll let you know when you've been unmuted and we have a three-hour limit. Brian, you've been unmuted. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> I, I just wanted to share that um, we've been working with OSHPIT on sharing a lot of this type of data. Um, many boards share it um, currently, um, although we're always tweaking it and trying to provide the um, the right data that OSHPIT needs to do its workforce analysis. Um, I guess the department does not have a position on the legislation um, that I'm aware of, um, but I, I guess I would just ask that the board um, consider not taking an opposed position at this time um, just because I th we've been working um, with OSHPED um, on a very on a very similar effort to to be sharing this data um, and I and in speaking with the staff at OIS I don't believe that it's going to be as significant of an issue um, so I, I uh, I'm not sure how um, needed um, the opposed position based on a implementation on those implementation concerns, um, if that if that exists. What Heather or Sharice like to respond? So Brian, you're saying that. DCA would like us not to take an opposed position because we think we can somehow implement it through DCA. Um, well, I don't or that you guys <laughs> will run it. I don't know that the department is asking. I'm, I guess I'll just share. I'm just sharing my perspective of the work that I've been doing with Oshped and uh, with Sean O'Connor. And unfortunately, he's he's not on the call or the meeting anymore. But um, in, in speaking with him, I don't I don't anticipate that this will be. Um, a significant cost or um, a uh, a significant impact to the board. I think we can find a solution um, that would work to address Oshped's needs. Um, there's also trailer bill um, language um, that would have us be sharing um, this same information with Oshped or or very similar. I think that there's there's some differences between the TBL as well as um, twelve thirty six. Um, so uh, I, I guess unless there's concerns with the actual language and some of the um, things that are being asked for, I don't, I don't think that implementing it will be as, uh, as uh, difficult as, uh, as you guys, I think, initially thought. I would suggest I have fewer concerns if DCA is, is saying that they have an IT solution that this scientifically uh, selected random sample of licensees can be picked and the data can be collected at the DCA level and then shared. But if it's gotta be at our board level, that's where I get concerned. But happy to talk to Sean O'Connor and you for sure about whatever DCA is thinking. And I do want to add that the bill is currently on suspense file due to the IT cost for the DCA boards. So I don't think we're the only board that would have costs with it since we're on this older IT system. This is Todd. Um, I have a question. If we were to take an oppose position now since it's suspended could we go back and revisit it and change our position in the future oh yes if um the bill we will be meeting again in august and um, depending what the bill looks like at that point we can change our position okay so if at that point if something comes out where it looks like it's something that's doable or is not going to have that much of an impact, we can always change. Correct. Thank you. Then I would recommend we we keep it as it is for the moment. 
Okay, before we go back to dealing with the motion, are there any other public comments? Thank you, Madam Chair. There are no further uh, requests for public comment. Would you like me to close the Q and A panel? Yes, please. Okay, it's closed. So, as as I understand what Todd is saying, I, I believe he is allowed to withdraw the motion, and we'll take a watch position if you wish. I'm sorry, that was um, maybe a misunderstanding on my oh. part. I, I was not um, asking to withdraw the motion. I was clarifying that we could keep the motion as opposed, and we could always revisit it in August and change our position at that time to watch if we so desired at that time, once things had an opportunity to maybe play out a little bit more. Hmm. Or, or can we just, uh, this is Karen, can we just, Keep it as a watch right now. I believe Todd would have to withdraw his motion, or we have to vote vote on that motion. Well, that was my if, question too. If we can put it as a watch as well, this is Gilbert. If, if the majority of the board feels that they want to switch it to a watch, then I will withdraw the motion since if we vote for it, everyone's going to say nay, and then we'll end up back to where we were. So I have no problem withdrawing the motion if everyone feels they want to change it to a watch position. Is that the case? My point was, I was thinking we could maybe change it to a watch position in August if you know, once it has an opportunity to go through the, the cycle, but if we want to change it now, then I'm not necessarily completely opposed to that. I will bow to the will of the board. I feel comfortable with the watch position. Any others who want to say? I actually feel more comfortable with the watch position because an opposed position, I feel like is um, a bit more drastic than a watch position. Hi, this is Holly. Um, I, I feel comfortable with a watch. It sounds like there's some more um, communication uh, that needs to go back and forth for this to evolve before we would take an opposition to it. Okay, Gilda. I'm also comfortable um, putting this on a watch because I, we can further discuss the feasibility of, of following through um, with the with the demand. Okay, then uh, I uh, I move to uh, withdraw the motion. So I I think if Todd withdrew his motion, um, I think that would suffice. We can watch the bill and then move on to the next bill. Thank you. Okay. Okay, thank you. Heather, do you want to go on? Sure. Uh, the next bill is AB 29. This bill is currently <coughs> on the suspense file in the Assembly Appropriations Committee. Um, this bill will require the board to make all writings and materials for publicly noticed meetings available on the board's website and provided to any person requesting such materials in writing at least 72 hours prior to the meeting or on the same day the writings and materials are provided to board members, whichever is earlier. This bill will also prohibit the board from discussing or acting on any items not provided in advance of the meeting as required. Um, the board did have an opposed position on a similar bill um, last year um, because this board, this bill will result in the board being unable to discuss and act on agenda items if the materials cannot be provided in advance of the meeting as required. Although the board strives to get all materials posted on its website prior to board meetings, occasionally board materials require last minute updates and changes. Additionally, the board does not currently have the ability to update its own website and must use DCA's internet team to post materials on the website, which requires a good amount of lead time for processing. This bill may limit board discussion and prevent some agenda items from being discussed at all. 
There are um, a number of boards um, that have adopted a position on this already, including the Board of Behavioral Sciences, the Board of Pharmacy, the Board of Professional Engineers, Land Surveyors, and Geologists, and the Dental Hygiene Board, which have all adopted opposed and less amended positions, citing concerns about the 72-hour posting time frame, and that certain material should be completely exempt from the posting requirement. Is there some reason why we haven't taken a opposed and less amended um, recommendation? Um, we can. Um, the only concern we would have is if um, a certain material is not directly um, exempt from it, um, we would still be limited if we didn't post it. And so I think the challenge is kind of identifying every possible material that we would want to be exempt. Um, and if we missed one and um, it's not exempt, then we would have to comply. This is Sharif, and I, I think the biggest concern is that this really limits the updated information we can bring to board meetings and the discussions that can occur um, I know Paul has mentioned it before where, you know, when we had in person 2 day board meetings, sometimes a question would come up on day 1 and we could go back and get the information and have it ready for the board on day 2. Um, it really kind of just stymies the information flow at that point and usually um, imposed unless amended you, you want to have something specifically that you're going to. That you are okay with changing that would remove your opposition. So, if in general we're opposed to having our ability to discuss items stymied to when we can post something to the internet, then an, a general oppose is usually more recommended. This is Paul. I just want to add to that that you know it's a it's a fine balance trying to um, have the materials ahead of time. But it's also trying to have the information that's needed for the board meeting. And sometimes, even during uh, this meeting, we would have been limited in what we could talk about because some information does come to us uh, later on, or we, you know, we think of something after the, after the materials have been prepared. So this this bill makes it difficult for us to do that. Thank you. Uh, Holly. I'm, I'm sorry, I forgot to take my hand down from before. Oh, okay. Um, is there any other board um, discussion or questions regarding this bill before we ask for a motion? Seeing none, I would um, entertain a motion to oppose AB 29. Hi, this is Holly. I oppose. I, I make a motion to oppose um, uh, AB 29. Do we have a second? This is Gilda. I second. Okay. Is there any uh, further discussion before we ask for public comment? Seeing none, can we open the uh, open it up to public comment or questions? Thank you, Madam Chair. I've opened up the question and answer panel. If any member of the public would like to comment, please type. I would like to make a comment using the field in the lower right hand corner of your screen and submit it to all panelists. This is the moderator. I see no request for public comment. Would you like me to close the Q&A panel? Yes, please. All right, it's closed. Okay, if there's no further discussion, uh, Sharice, could you call the vote? Yes, I can. Dr. Raggio. Aye. Ms. Kaiser. Aye. Mr. Borges. Aye. Ms. Chang. Aye. Ms. Dominguez. Aye. Ms. Snow. Aye. And the motion carries. Thank you. Um, Heather? Okay, the next bill on our list is AB 107. Um, this bill is currently on the Assembly Appropriations Committee. 
This bill will require boards to issue a temporary license within 30 days to applicants currently licensed in another state who are married to or in a domestic par partnership with an active duty member of the military currently stationed in California. This temporary license will expire 12 months after issuance or upon issuance of a permanent license, whichever occurs first. Um, this bill will remove current provisions that allow a temporary license to expire upon the denial of an application. Additionally, this bill will require the board to track applications and licensing statistics for military personnel and spouses. I am recommending an oppose unless amended position um, because this bill will remove a current provision that allows a temporary license to become invalid if the application for a permanent license is denied. The board already has a process in place to expedite applications for military personnel and spouses, so the board rarely issues this temporary license. However, since the bill eliminates this provision that would make a temporary license invalid upon the denial of an application, this bill could potentially allow unqualified individuals authority to practice under a temporary license for 12 months. Are there any questions? Any board questions or comments? If not, I would entertain a motion to um, oppose unless amended AB 107. This is Holly. I make a motion that we uh, um, that we oppose AB 107, 107 unless amended. Okay, do we have a I, second? Sorry. I second it. Debbie? Yes. Is, is there any further discussion on this um, on this bill by the board? Seeing none, so, I'd like to open it up to public comment. Thank you, Madam Chair. The Q&A panel is now available. If any member of the public would like to make a comment, please type, I would like to make a comment using the field in the lower right-hand corner of the screen and submit it to all panelists. All right, this is a moderator. I see no requests for comment at this time. Would you like me to close the Q&A panel? Yes, please. Okay, it's been closed. Okay, if there's no other further board discussion, I'd like to ask Therese to call the vote. Dr. Raggio? Aye. Ms. Kaiser? Aye. Mr. Borges? Aye. Ms. Chang? Ms. Dominguez? Aye. Oh, sorry. Aye. Sorry. Thank you. Ms. Dominguez? Aye. Ms. Snow? Aye. Motion carries. Okay, thank you. Okay, Heather. Heather. Yeah. The next bill is AB 225. This bill is currently on the Assembly Appropriations Committee suspense file. This bill will expand current law requiring a temporary license for applicants currently licensed in another state who are married to or in a domestic partnership with an active duty member of the military currently stationed in California to also apply to applicants who are veterans discharged for within the previous six months and active duty military personnel who will be separating from the military within 90 days. Additionally, this bill includes a um, provision that allows a temporary license to expire upon the denial of an application. And this bill will also extend the time frame that a temporary license is, is valid from 12 months to 18 months. 
I'm also recommending a pose and less amended position on this bill um, because of similar concerns with the last bill about eliminating a provision, making a temporary license invalid upon the denial of an application. This bill could potentially allow unqualified individuals authority to practice under a temporary license for 18 months. Are there any questions about this one? It's the, the concerns are the same as the last one that we took a post less amended position on. I just ask an aside, how, how does a domestic partnership, uh, how is that verified? Uh, California does um, have a formal domestic partnership process. I believe it goes through the secretary of state, but I may be mistaken. There is an actual formal process to become a domestic partner here in California. So for bills like this, you have to actually demonstrate this um, legal relationship. I'm going to defer if Sharice knows on the licensing, how we do the process. I was going to ask Lisa to chime in. It, it's so rare. Um, we don't get that many military um, license applications in the first place or military spouse. Um, normally they all come with paperwork. Um, associated with it and those states that have domestic partnership laws usually have some form of registration which has some verification included in it so yes it would be this is lisa they would receive a or um, some sort of registration that uh, certificate and um, that would be submitted with their application and verified in order to uh, proceed with the process okay is there any further discussion or are there questions by board members regarding this bill? Seeing none, I'd like to call for um, a motion to oppose uh, AB 225. Unless amended, excuse me. This is Gilda. I move to oppose. Excuse me. I move to oppose um, AB 225 unless amended. Do I have a second? This is Holly. I second. Okay. If there isn't any other further discussion by the board, I'd like to open this up to uh, public comment. Thank you, Madam Chair. I have opened up the Q&A panel. If any member of the public would like to make a comment, please type. I would like to make a comment using the field in the lower right hand corner of your screen and submit it to all panelists. We will give you a moment. Okay. All right, I see no requests for comment. Would you like me to close the Q&A panel? Yes, please. Okay, it's closed. Okay, uh, there's no further discussion. Uh, can I ask uh, Sharice to call the vote? Absolutely. Dr. Raggio. Aye. Ms. Kaiser. Aye. Mr. Borges. Aye. Ms. Chang. Aye. Ms. Dominguez. Aye. Ms. Snow. Ms. Snow. I think it looks like Ms. Snow might be having audio problems. Okay, currently that is at five to zero and that does pass. We can always check back in with uh, Ms. Snow on her audio connection as well. Okay. Okay, um, we will do that. Uh, Heather, would you like to uh, proceed? Yes. 
AB646 is currently on the suspense file in the Assembly Appropriations Committee. This bill will require boards that post information on their website about a revoked license due to a criminal conviction to post the expungement order if the person reapplies for licensure or remove the initial posting if the person does not apply, reapply for licensure within 90 days of the board receiving an expungement order related to the conviction. The board may charge a fee not exceeding the reasonable cost of administering this provision. Um, board staff is recommending a watch position. This bill will require the board to create a new process for license verifications. Um, license verifications are critical re when reporting prior discipline to other state licensing boards. And since this board only removes the conviction from the public website and does not remove the board's ability to report to other state licensing entities that the license was revoked, the board would need to make a process change in how these verifications are prepared by stopping usage of the public DCA license search and instead using the board's internal IT system. The workload for this new process will be minor and absorbable. Are there any questions about this one? Any board questions or comments? Seeing none, I'd like to ask for public comment at this time. Thank you, Madam Chair. I have opened up the Q&A panel. If any member of the public would like to make a comment, please type. I would like to make a comment using the field in the lower right-hand corner of your screen and submit it to all panelists. We will give you a moment. Assistant moderator, I see no request for public comment at this time. Would you like me to close the Q&A panel? Yes, please. Okay, it's closed. Okay, since we're taking a watch position on this one, we don't need a motion. Um, can we move on to the next uh, bill? Yes. AB 885, this bill is currently in the Assembly Governmental Organization Committee. Um, since it was not heard in its first policy committee, this will be a two-year bill. This bill will amend current law regarding public meetings held by teleconference to only require the agenda to include a primary physical meeting location where the public may physically attend and participate. Board members attending the meeting via teleconference or physically at the primary physical meeting location will count toward establishing a quorum. And this bill will require public meetings held by tele teleconference to include both an audible and visual means of participation. Board staff is recommending a support position um, because in the past the board has experienced difficulty in finding locations available to the public for board meetings held via teleconference. This bill will alleviate this issue by only requiring one location where the public may physically attend and participate. Additionally, due to the COVID-19 pandemic, the board already has a process that allows the public to participate remotely in meetings held via teleconference. And this technology has the ability to allow for both audible and visual means of participation. Are there any questions? Debbie? Yes, I just wanted to try audio again. Okay. Is it working? I'm yeah. sorry. <laughs> yeah, it's working. Thank you. I was waiting for a moment to try. Thank you. <laughs> okay, thanks. Are there any other uh, board comments or questions regarding um, this bill? Holly. Um, so in the summary, it says that uh, visual would also be required and we're obviously not doing that right now. Um, so if we were in a situation where like this pandemic, where we're needing to do everything virtually, would we need to do um, visual under this new uh, law? 
Yes, that is correct. We would need to do visual, but the technology we are using right now does allow for visual. Mm -hmm. We just don't have that option turned on. So it would just be a matter of basically setting our meeting to also include that feature, but it wouldn't require any new technology um, other than what we already have been using this past year. Okay, thank you. My understanding is that the to use visual has some kind of um, glitches in terms of um, uh, losing contact and so on uh, with using the visual portion of it. Uh, is there? Oh, this is any, Teresa. I just oh, want sorry. to confirm. Just wanted to confirm what Dr. Raggio was saying is that other boards that have turned on every single board member has their video um, pro, um, projecting onto the program has they some of them have experienced where um, by using the video and increasing the bandwidth on that meeting that some members do get kicked off and have to rejoin so it, it sometimes can cause some glitches um, so okay. that, that is currently why we don't use it and but we could always find additional ways um, of even looking at um, grouping people so some of them could be here our conference room has a webcam. Um, board members could also um, attend the meeting virtually together, obviously not during the pandemic, but um, future. So um, post pandemic, it does provide more opportunities and a little more flexibility. Okay, thank you. Any other uh, comments or questions? Okay, um, before we ask for public comment, I'd like, I would entertain a, a um, a motion. This is Holly. I I move that we support the position on AB eight eight five. Okay. Is there a second? Second. Okay. Any further discussion from the board? Seeing none, can we open this up for public comment? Thank you, Madam Chair. The Q&A panel is now available. If any member of the public would like to make a comment, please type, I would like to make a comment using the field in the lower right-hand corner of the screen and submit it to all panelists. We will give you a moment. This is a moderator. I see no request for public comment at this time. Would you like me to close the Q&A panel? Yes, thank you. Okay, it's closed. Okay, if there's no further discussion, I'd like Sharice to call the vote. Absolutely. Dr. Raju. Aye. Ms. Kaiser. Aye. Mr. Borges. Aye. Ms. Chang. Aye. Ms. Dominguez. Aye. Ms. Snow. Aye. Motion carries. Thank you. Okay, Heather. Okay, the next bill is AB 1026. This bill is currently on the Assembly Appropriations Committee. This bill will require boards to grant a 50% fee reduction for an initial license for military veterans who provide satisfactory evidence with their application. This bill defines satisfactory evidence as a driver's license or identification card with veteran printed on its face. I am recommending a watch position since the board has such a small licensing. Um, the board has a small licensing population of military personnel and spouses. On average, the board receives less than 50 applicants for military personnel or spouses per year. So the revenue loss by reducing the initial license fee for military veterans would be minimal. Any questions about this one? Was this was this bill heard May 5th in the Assembly Appropriations Committee? Uh, yes, it was, and it went to the suspense file, which means um, in a couple weeks, the assembly appropriations will revisit all these bills on the suspense file. 
um, and decide which ones they're going to move forward and um, which ones will stay on the suspense file. Is there any reason not to support this since the the um, the revenue loss would be minimal? We don't have many. Is is there some reason not to? Um, no, the board can definitely entertain a motion to support. Um, generally, for these, I stay with watch just because our population is so small. But there is no issue um, with going with the support either. But you advise watch just um, to see the eventualities with it. Um, more because there is a revenue loss, um, but it's minor. So if we want to take a position that we're supporting um, helping veterans um, become licensed, um, there's definitely not a concern with going in that direction. Well, this is Paul. I had a quick question for Heather. Um, yes. Heather, did we find out um, what if any IT costs were involved in um, structuring this so that we could take the decrease in the initial license fee on our system? Um, I don't believe we did look into the IT costs for this one. I think they're strictly looking at what is your licensing population and will the dollar value of that decrease be a concern? Because there's definitely boards that have a very large military personnel licensing population and obviously the financial hit to them would be much greater than to us with our 50 applicants per year. But we did not look into the IT impact. Okay, so I assume that there would be just some one-time initial costs and in reprogramming. Yes, uh, usually those are considered um, minor for um, IT, uh, somewhere in like, I think it's like the $5,000 range or something like that. For us, for the minor one. Okay, thanks. So I'd like to uh, elicit um, opinions from the board regarding whether to continue on a watch position with this bill or change to a support position. This is Todd um, being a veteran myself. I typically would support anything of this nature that would support our uh, military or their families. Thank you. Anyone else? Uh, this is Holly. I was really on the fence, but hearing Todd say that I'm kind of swayed over to supporting it. I would support it also. And anyone else with a, a, a thought about it? This is Gilda. I agree. Um, I, I'm, I support that. Thank okay. You for your service. Any other board member with a, an opinion? I think that was at least 4 of us with that I, opinion of changing it. <laughs> I'd go for support. Okay. So I think that could be five. I actually didn't tally that. So if we did change it, we would have we would have to um, have a motion for this bill. That's correct. We just need a motion. In a second. Okay. Anybody? Uh, I move that we uh, change our position to support for AB 1026. Okay, do we have a second? I second. Is that Karen? Karen. Mm -hmm. Is there any uh, further board discussion on this uh, bill? Seeing none, I'd like to ask for public comment. Thank you, Madam Chair. 
I've now opened up the Q&A panel. If any member of the public would like to comment, please type. I would like to make a comment using the field in the lower right hand corner of your screen and submit it to all the panelists. We will give you a moment. This is the moderator. I see no request for public comment at this time. Would you like me to close the Q&A panel? Yes, thank you. You're welcome. Okay, with no further discussion, I'd like um, Sharice to call the vote if she would. Absolutely. Dr. Raju? Aye. Ms. Kaiser? Aye. Mr. Borges? Aye. Ms. Cheng? Aye. Ms. Dominguez? Aye. Ms. Snow? Aye. The motion carries. Okay, thank you. Okay, I've got a few more to look at today, Heather. Yes, the next one is SB 607. Um, this bill has been rescheduled for its hearing in Senate Appropriations Committee to May 17th. This bill will, among other things, require boards to waive all fees associated with the application and initial license for applicants currently licensed in another state who are married to or in a domestic partnership with an active duty member of the military currently stationed in California. This bill was also recently amended to authorize board members to attend a teleconference from an undisclosed location. The board will not have to provide a physical meeting location, but will need to provide the public with means to participate remotely. Um, I initially had recommended a watch position, um, but in light of these amendments, um, and also since the board just um, supported waiving fees um, in the previous bill, the board may wish to consider um, a support position or possibly support if amended to further clarify the language regarding the fees. Um, and the only concern I have with the current language is since it says application and initial license fees, it is possible that could include waiving exam fees and fingerprinting fees. Um, so we may wish to um, request that they clarify that language um, if we do go with a support um, if amended position. Um, but then again, our licensing pop population for military is less than 50 applications per year. So even if we have to waive exam fees and um, fingerprinting fees, it's not a huge amount. Um, so just a couple possible options of different directions the, bill may, the board may wish to go on this bill. Would it be helpful to the board staff if um, they didn't have to check more boxes of what has to be waived? Is that a difficulty at all? <clears throat> I mean, fingerprinting fees and so on, making sure that those things, all the boxes are checked. Uh, is it more trouble for you if it doesn't spell it out? Um. I'm going to see if maybe Lisa can speak to that or Sharice. I'm sorry, can, can you repeat the question? I'm not sure what the process is, but if we have to um, waive or check to waive uh, additional fees, is that um, a burden on the board in terms of whatever your mechanisms are for checking those things? If it isn't. Uh, spelled out in the bill. If it's Maybe not in spelled out in the bill, that that would create a little more work. Or I, I think we would just need to add additional boxes to all forms and all like exam applications. Um, it's kind of hard to tell because I mean, in the fingerprinting one, I, I don't. I'm also not completely sure how that would work if if that's included. It is much cleaner and simpler if it is just the initial application because that's something we already have and we already check for and, and that's easier to just waive and also to program into the system to waive when that box is checked. So. 
Lisa, did you have anything? Uh, no, not really. I mean, we have so few of these applications. Um, it, it would create a little bit of a workload um, if the fees were waived for um, all types, especially when it comes to exams. Um, but um, it's certainly something that could be done within a you know short period of time for staff. Todd. Just to make sure I'm clear, this is only for those who are currently licensed as an audiologist or dispenser or what have you in another state. This is not someone who is um, a spouse of a military member who wants to become a dispenser or get their license in the state for the first time. This is someone who Perfect. currently has experience and is licensed. Correct. Yes, this is someone currently licensed in another state that's a military spouse. Okay. Because, I mean, looking at it, it's like, well, we're giving them more than we are the veterans in the previous bill. The previous bill, the vets only get 50%, whereas in this one, we're giving them everything. But I imagine the group is even smaller, as you say, with it's someone who's currently licensed. And it was probably an oversight on the part of the author's office to not include those kinds of fees. Um, so would it be an incredible burden on them to to add that sort of language, do you think? You mean to expand it to also include veterans yeah. and not just um, military spouses? No, I just mean the additional fees you were talking about, fingerprinting and so on. Uh, that they actually uh, spell that out. I mean, if, if we oppose, if amended, would we be able to submit our amendments, our suggested amendments to the language and not without causing a big burden on the author's office to make those small changes? Oh yeah, it wouldn't be a huge burden um, because it is already ambiguous in the language well, what exactly fees are they wanting us to waive? Are they wanting it to include fingerprints and um, exam? I think it's just, it's nuanced for us, but not necessarily without the legislature knowing our process. They may not even know that this is unclear to us what exactly they want to be waived. So by submitting what our amendments are, we're just basically asking clarify what it is you want us to waive and that we're suggesting it's only the initial license application fee. So I suspect they would entertain adding all fees in there. Um, uh, this was heard on May 10th, is that right? I uh, know it was rescheduled to 17th, um, I imagine because they recently amended it to include the language regarding the teleconferencing that they want to um, look at all of that language together. Well, I never think it's a bad idea to spell things out uh, with as much clarity as possible uh, because you never know what's what issues are going to come down the road. Um, so I would be in favor of supporting if amended, but I, are there other board members who feel otherwise? Want to keep it as a watch? I would agree. I think it should be spelled out. What, what exactly are you providing to them for free? Because, you know, I don't think, I think the application fee, yes, but some of the others, I don't know if I would necessarily agree with that. So I would like to know. Precisely what they're what they're discussing. And obviously, they would need some sort of guidance from us as to what that is. But I would I would support um, opposing unless amended. Okay, thank you. Uh, any other board members? Uh, Gilda. Yes, I agree that. Um, it would be beneficial to find out specifically what the um, additional fees um, are, what all entails um, in that verbiage and have it clearly spelled out. Thank you. 
Anyone else with a, a thought or opinion? Well, um, I do. I Instead of a flat out oppose, can we do a oppose unless amended or also do a watch? Well, I was going to ask if we can, is the vernacular support if amended? Is that? Oh, a, yes, support if amended. Is that possible, Dr. Heather? Yes. Dr. Roger, he, can I chime in? Oh, go, go ahead. Oh. Either. I, I want, go ahead, Heather. Uh, I'm sorry, is that Heather or Sharice? It's Heather. I was just okay, going to say the board can do support if amended, watch or oppose unless amended. But I want to point out when you do as amended for either position, it's us telling them what we want the amendments to be in order for the bill to be supported by us. So, for example, we would need to say this for this bill should be limited to only waiving the application fee. Not we're not getting clarification from them. We're telling them what we want to see the bill look like, if that makes sense. Is it possible? I, I was going to, I was just going to say the same thing. I think at this point, since we don't have specific direction to them, we may not want to support unless amended. We could actually watch the bill and still reach out to um, legislative staff and then come back to the board with more information. Okay, that sounds good. Uh, Gilda? Sorry, I'll take my hand down. Oh, <laughs> okay. Um, so, it, would the board feel comfortable uh, maintaining the watch position for this uh, bill at this time, since we have an avenue to readdress this later? I would, as long as we have wiggle room, that's agreeable. Mm -hmm. Holly? I agree with um, uh, being comfortable with watch. I'm comfortable with watch. Anybody not comfortable with that? Holly, did you have another comment? No, I apologize. <laughs> it's an it's an occupational hazard. Um, okay, so it looks like we're fairly comfortable uh, leaving this at the watch um, uh, recommendation. If we can come back to it later. So, if there's no other board discussion, I'd like to open this up for public comment. Thank you, Madam Chair. The Q&A panel is now available. If any member of the public would like to make a comment, please type, I would like to make a comment using the field in the lower right-hand corner of your screen and submit it to all panelists. We will give you a moment. This is the moderator. I see no requests for public comment. Would you like me to close the Q&A panel? Yes, thank you. You're welcome. Okay, since we're taking a watch position, uh, we are we don't need a motion on that bill. We'd like to move to the next one. Okay, SB 731. Um, this bill is currently on the Senate Appropriations Committee suspense file. This bill will expand criminal record relief by way of petition to any felony conviction, specifically those that are punishable by a term of incarceration in state prison. This bill will also expand automatic arrest record relief for specified convictions. This bill will expand upon recent criminal justice reforms by creating further mechanisms for conviction dismissal. Current law already requires the Department of Justice to exclude records of arrest and conviction that were granted relief starting July 1, 2022. And this bill will expand upon the types of arrests and convictions that must be excluded. We are recommending a watch position at this time. Maybe you could put that in lay terms. Oh, this, uh, the, the legal language is uh, daunting in some cases. 
It's basically um, after AV 2138, we saw some legislation that um, is addressing the records that we receive from the Department of Justice and requiring the Department of Justice to review their records. And um, if certain convictions ended up being dismissed or were granted a relief, um, they need to be taken off the report. So basically what this means for us is when we do our background checks, if something falls under the records that have to be, um, that can't be included on that report, we won't see that that conviction had occurred. Is there a, an obvious downside to that? For us, I mean. This is Sharice. I, I think there's definite downsides, but I, I don't. We boards have lost this argument now twice. Um, mm -hmm. So I think there's not as much. Uh, what do you want to? say initiative to push to oppose um, some of these additional you can't see them um, bills where it's like uh, it'll just remove things off the criminal background check. Was this bill heard on May 3rd? I am looking right now. Yes, and it was placed on the suspense file on May 3rd. Okay, is there any uh, further board discussion about this bill? Yeah, this Holly. is Holly. Yeah, thank you. Um, is relief the same as expungement? I'm just not I'm familiar enough with what that means. I hope please check the number and dial again. Hi, this is Paul. I don't think that this is referring to expungement. I think this is using uh, relief in terms of how the board deals with the records. And I would defer to. Welcome to WebEx. Into your app. Hello. Can everyone still hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. Okay, oh, I can hear you. And, and I was just going to ask uh, our legal counsel if he had any input on that. I, I'm. The way I understand it is we're talking when we're talking about criminal record relief, we're talking about in terms of the board. The board interaction with these records. I, I also think we might have connection problems with Heather. And I think Sharice was going to. Okay, I think we. I think she's able to still talk. But our recommendation is a watch position. Well, we're going to wait for Mr. Payne to. We're see having difficulty too. I don't see him on our list of attendees, so hopefully. Oh, I do. Questions. Oh, do you? Okay. Yeah. But his the, the microphone keeps uh, coming and going. Okay. So it sounds like relief means that we're not at, we don't have access to that information. Right, that because they don't have to supply it. Right, because expungement is a specific legal term dealing with those uh, those crimes and criminal records. 
I, I'm currently perusing the bill and so far what I'm seeing is relief in the form of no longer being on an arrest record that would be available. Um, usually this means for DCA and other employment purposes, but usually doesn't include law enforcement and other things who would have um, full access no matter what. Mm -hmm. Okay. That, that, makes, that makes sense to me now. Is there any other board discussion on this bill? Um, can you, can you tell me, this is Karen, can you tell me again why we decided to put a watch on this one? I, I don't know if Paul, you want to speak to this, but, um, from experience, I, I think we've gotten to the point where, um, some of these are, um, you can oppose all you want and we can try all we want, but we're, we're not really getting traction on these issues with the legislature. Um, and especially in the, in the forms of why we should be able to see them. Um, and a lot of, of the, a lot of the ability to use them for the purposes of licensure or denial of licensure is, was already kind of taken away in 2138 and 1076 couple years ago, so um, it kind of becomes a moot issue on it. If you can't use it for the purposes of denying a license, do you really need to see it on the arrest record? And is it really worth putting an opposed position out there for that? So it is kind of more of a political consideration. Right. Got it. Hello, this is Anthony. Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay, I just I just decided to leave and then rejoin. So um, I I think I heard most of it, and I I think I would tend to agree with that. Essentially, the expungement's a term of art that's you're seeking specific court relief, while uh, the other term that you've mentioned is just going to bar uh, consideration for purposes of board discipline. Is that is that what everyone's understanding has been thus far? Yes, I think so. I think it's also helpful to understand that a lot of this deals with um, applicants rather than licensees where we do have more purview and we do get subsequent arrest notifications from the Department of Justice. So. Is there any further board uh, discussion? Seeing none, let me open this up for public comment. Thank you, Madam Chair. The question and answer panel uh, question and answer panel is now available. If you would like to make a comment, please type. I would like to make a comment using the field in the lower right hand corner of your screen and submit it to all panelists. We will give you a moment to access the feature. This is the moderator. I see no request for public comment at this time. Would you like me to close the Q&A feature? Yes, thank you. You're welcome. Okay, since we're keeping a watch position, we don't need a motion on that bill. And we have a couple more. Heather? Who can hear me? Can hear me? Yes. There's an echo, but I can hear you. Okay, why, why don't I go ahead and kick it off then um, while Heather's working on her audio. Um, so SB 772 Ochoabo, um, Professions and Vocations Citations Minor Violations. Uh, this bill is currently in the Senate Business Professions and Economic Development Committee. The bill would prohibit the assessment of an administrative fine for minor violations if the licensee corrects the violation within 30 days. Minor violations are defined as those that do not pose a serious health or safety threat, are not willful, do not occur while on probation, and are not violations that the licensee has a history of committing. Uh, the board often uses its authority to issue citations and assess an administrative fine for minor violations um, of the Practice Act. And examples of these kind of activities include um, that we've issued citations for in the past include unlicensed activity, false advertising, not cooperating with a board investigation. The 
citation and fine is another tool in the toolkit of the board to enforce the laws and regulations. Um, and these administrative fines serve the purpose of preventing future violations, protecting consumers, and support the cost of the investigation leading up to the citation. Uh, over the past three years, the board has issued an average of $12,983 per year in citation and fine charges, and all of these cite and fine charges fall within the definition of minor violation under the bill, um, which would prevent the board from assessing administrative fines for any of these violations. And that is the reason we are suggesting an opposed position. Um, while this bill may have been targeted more towards the um, pandemic related citation and fines for other boards, um, you know, such as uh, um, Bar Bar uh, Barber and Cosmo and, and others, um, this is citation and fines an important tool in the toolbox of enforcement for the board. And if the board can't cite, cite and find someone for not cooperating in the board's investigation, that, that becomes problematic. Sometimes that is the, the thing that pushes people to start working with the board and start responding. Um, so I, I think removing that tool, um, it seems like a knee jerk response to something that's happening within the last year and a half and other boards. And it's kind of a wide swath painting a large brush, um, which we don't recommend either. Um, so we recommend an opposed position. Paul. Yes, I just I just want to add to that um, that contrary to popular belief, we don't or to some opinions, we don't bring in a lot of money with the citation revenue. That, that citation, as as was mentioned earlier, is for consumer protection. It also serves as a deterrent. It's educational. Um, if we did not, if this bill were to pass, um, enforcement would become a cat and mouse game in which you would point out a, a flaw or something, a, a violation, and someone would correct it just because you pointed it out. But if you're able to to cite and fine. Um, licensees who who violate these laws, then it acts as a deterrent to do it again. If they know that as long as if they get caught, they have to pay or they have to comply, they're just going to keep doing it. And in the past, this board has had that experience. Thank you. So would you say this is fairly effective, the, the site and find process in deterring future violations? I, I think it can be, yes. And, and again, just to uh, a, a good example would be, um, you know, refund issues. If people, if licensees only give refunds because the board points it out and not because they're abiding by the law, then it becomes a constant more of mediation work instead of just expecting licensees to abide by the law. Same with other things, advertising or not cooperating with an investigation. Okay, I'm going to cooperate because I'm about to get cited, not because the law requires me to. What would be a maximum fine? The maximum fines are, we have two different uh, sections of law, but we can fine on the speech and ideology side, I believe up to $5,000. And on the hearing aid dispenser side, I, I believe that amount is less. Say it's twenty five hundred. Okay. Is there any further um, board discussion or questions? Okay. Hearing none, I'd like to uh, entertain a motion to oppose SB seven seven two. I move to oppose SB 772. Do we have a second? I second it. I second it, Debbie. Okay. Okay, if there's, is there any further discussion on behalf of the board regarding this, this bill? Seeing none, I'd like to open this up for public comment. 
Thank you, Madam Chair. The question and answer feature is now available. If anyone would like to make a comment, please type. I would like to make a comment using the field in the lower right hand corner of your screen and submit it to all panelists. We will give you a moment. This is a moderator. I see no request for public comment. Would you like me to close the Q&A panel? Yes, thank you. You're welcome. Okay, uh, with no further discussion, um, Cherise, could you call the vote? Absolutely. Dr. Raggio. Aye. Ms. Kaiser. Aye. Mr. Borges. Aye. Ms. Chang. Aye. Ms. Dominguez? Aye. Ms. Snow? Aye. The motion carries. Okay. Um, looks like that was our, our last item under um, agenda item 14. Thank you, Heather, for all the work you've done to put this together and provide us with all the information so we could make a, a good decision. Um, I'm just wondering if people would like to take perhaps a 10 minute bio break. Yes, that would be great. Yes, yes. thank yes. you. Yes, please. Yes, thank you. Okay, so uh, let's say we um, come back at 2.35, 2.40. Let's go with 2.40. Oh, 4.35. <laughs> Did you say 235? I think so, Paul. She, I think she says uh, 235. Thank you. Okay, I'd like to get started again. We still have a few items to cover today. Um, I'd like to move on to agenda item 15, uh, legislative items for future meetings. And um, I'd like to turn it over to Heather and Sharice for that discussion. Hi, this is Heather Olivares. I do not have any um, legislative additional legislative items to bring to your attention. There are a few more I'm watching internally, um, but at this point, they're um, not of concern to us. I'm just monitoring to see what direction they go in. Um, but this is also an opportunity if board members have any legislative items they'd like to discuss, um, as well as anything the public would like to bring to our attention. Are there any um, board members with items they'd like to discuss? Seeing none, can we ask for a public comment on any items they would like to discuss? Thank you, Madam Chair. I've opened up the Q&A panel. If any member of the public would like to comment on this agenda item, please type. I would like to make a comment using the field in the lower right-hand corner of your screen and submit it to all panelists. We will give you a moment.
This is the moderator. I see no requests for public comment at this time. Would you like me to close the Q&A panel? Yes, thank you. You're welcome. This item says uh, whether to hold a special meeting of the board to discuss such items. Um, so I don't think there are items for the board to discuss, but there may be future legislative items that um, committees will be discussing and then bringing to the board. Uh, Sharice, would you like to add anything else? Not at this time, no. Okay, thank you. Okay, so I don't take any more action on that. I'd like to, we've already covered item number 16, so I'd like to move to 17. Discussion and possible action regarding audiology licensing requirements. Um, and I believe Sharice will be discussing this item. Yes, so uh, the this item is on the 12 month requirement and then of course, um, how that the board took the um, approved the legislative proposal to revise 2532.25 back in November of 2020. And as was reported earlier this morning, um, it's no longer going to be part of an omnibus provision, but part of the board's uh, 2022 sunset review process. Um, so we can obtain those statutory changes um, as part of the sunset review process or, or try to do it that way. And then um, as of right now, that just means um, it'll be another year and change before the statutory takes effect. But I think that would be a good reason to go ahead and recommend that the audiology practice committee start meeting to review what sort of regulatory um, amendments might be needed for those statutory changes, um, specifically to kind of look at um, what types of clinical rotations can be counted? Um, should should the types of clinical rotations that can be counted depend on the type and level of supervision? Should the experiences be limited to certain years? Should there be any limitations? Or should this be at the discretion of the program training directors? Um, what, time, what type of clinical clock hours can be counted? Um, direct patient care contact hours, um, shift hours, simulation hours. Um, past few years have brought about quite a few changes. Um, to be able to be considered. Um, and then also there are there any considerations for students from out of state programs or federal visas. And then um, the last one for those pre graduation hours, um, normally they don't have an RPE license and would the students need to hold that or not? Um, and we would just allow them to accrue a certain portion of those hours. Um, towards the 12 months. So um, just some of the issues that were up for discussion in prior meetings um, and now would be kind of a good time to go ahead and refer this issue over to the audiology practice committee to start fleshing out the regulatory changes that would go with the statutory changes that we hope to implement next year. Okay, and we'll be discussing that further in a few moments, but could you just clarify something for me? Um, when a, 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 an issue like this is in a sunset review and the sunset report is accepted, does that mean it circumvents the legislative process or just allows it to go forward? How, how do you, how does it work? Uh, actually, so the sunset review process is early in the legislative process. So usually hearings are in March or April and all of those changes end up in one of the Senate business and professions or assembly um, bills. So it doesn't circumvent the process. It's just flushed out more ahead and then it's put into what's called a spot bill. They put a spot bill in every year for the um, for the sunset provisions. Um, and that'll usually include a variety of things, updates to statute, um, reauthorization to exist as a board for another four years, um, and then substantive issues that either the committee or the board have brought up and want to implement. And so that's oftentimes where the board's gonna highlight an issue inside of the sunset review report, talk about it at the sunset review committee hearing, and then that will eventually make its way into a bill. Um, and that bill will go through the legislative process like a normal bill. Okay, I understand now. Uh, do we need, uh, is there any other discussion about Teresa's comments about this particular issue? Uh, seeing then, do we need a motion to move this or to refer this to the audiology practice committee or not? This does, does not require a motion as far as I know. Okay. Yeah.
Okay. Um, can I ask for any public comment on item number 17? Um, action regarding the audiology licensing requirements. Thank you, Madam Chair. I've opened up the Q&A panel. If any member of the public would like to make a comment, please type. I would like to make a comment using the field in the lower right hand corner of the screen and submit it to all panelists. We will give you a moment. This is the moderator. I see no requests for public comment. Would you like me to close the Q&A panel? Yes, thank you. You're welcome. Okay, since we don't need a motion on this, um, we will move to the next agenda item, uh, which has already been covered, number 18. So we'll move to number 19, discussion and possible action regarding continuing education, continuing professional development requirements. And I believe Sharice is going to discuss this topic. Yes, thank you, Dr. Raju. So kind of as a background, um, the hearing aid dispenser side and dispensing audiologist is inside of the um, California Code of Regulations 1399.140 at CEQA, and then the audiology and uh, speech language pathology uh, continuing education or continuing professional development requirements are in California Code of Regulations 1399.160 at CEQA. Um, back in November of 2015, the board approved revisions to the current uh, requirements for speech language pathologists and audiologists. Um, they also re-reviewed that in May of 2016 with a few additional changes. That's all provided in attachment A. Um, Around the same time, the hearing aid dispensers side and the dispensing audiologist had revisions made as well. So we've provided those current uh, regulations. Since that time, there's been a lot of advancements in online self-study and online interactive. Um, there's also issues that became more pronounced during the COVID-19 pandemic, um, where CE and CPD requirements have been temporarily waived through the waivers, but not the self-study, um, which has been difficult to obtain, especially um, when there's already more limited offerings on the dispensing audiologist and hearing aid dispensing side. And then... Um, the whole concept of C continuing education or continuing professional development requirements are intended to protect California consumers by ensuring licensees continue to increase their professional knowledge and skills to maintain competency and enhance consumer services. Uh, prior to the board approved uh, revisions being submitted to the Office of Administrative Law, the board, um, we think it's a good time for us to re, -re, -re review the language in them to see if they are currently what best protects California consumers or whether there are alternatives that incorporate new advances in online learning that could equally protect California consumers. And again, the board's purview and mission is consumer protection and ensuring that there is the best alternative is of, to protect con the best regulations to protect consumers is what we're advancing um, and to take into account um, you know, there's quite a few changes in the last six years. Um, so uh, staff actually recommends that the current um, regulations for hearing aid dispensers and also the proposed, pre previously proposed changes to the continuing professional development requirements for speech language pathologists and audiologists all get taken to the practice committees in order to determine if there's additional revisions that are necessary and merited and that those committees can take a much deeper dive into whether um, the professions and the general practice in their professions merits different considerations. Um, coming from a, a prior board at psychology, you know, a lot of people are in, in their private practice and therefore they have less interaction um, with other practitioners. And so sometimes the continuing education that is live allows for that sort of um, Participatory learning, also that kind of ethical checks. Um, I would point out psychology is looking and they've already noticed their their new guidelines for CE, which are part of a national um, board of national state boards of psychology um, structure, which is a very 
different and complex um, system, and I'm not saying I would or would not recommend going that way, but it definitely looks at the practice and what's important for them and what helps um, maintain competency and improve skills there. Um, and so it, I think it would be merited to have but all of the practice committees take another look at what they're doing, especially before we go ahead and send our self-study CE regulations through the actual rulemaking process. And I have quite I have a few public comments that I'll that we received via email, um, but I'll go ahead and wait to read those to the board once we get to public comment. Okay, are there any? Um... Board member comments or questions on this item? So basically, okay. since this is my first time at this level with the um, with the separate committees, from this point, we would just get together with the separate committees to discuss it and then bring it back to the board. Absolutely. That way the committee can flesh out actual revisions to the language that they believe are merited, they can get stakeholder input at that point, and then bring back a fleshed out package to the board. What is the typical timeline for something like that happening from having, you know, getting together with the meeting to bringing it back to the board? Could be three to four months, could be six months or more. I, okay. I my, my distinction would be is I came from psychology and sometimes those are much longer conversations and so it would take a few meetings um, and quite a bit of fleshing out um, before it became back to the board. Um, so it would spend a, quite a while in committee depending on the complexity of the issue. So. And these would be meetings basically we just schedule amongst ourselves to to meet. Uh, because it's your hearing aid, their standing committees, they are publicly mm -hmm. noticed. So we would have them as a publicly noticed meeting of the hearing aid dispensers commit practice committee, the audiology practice committee, right. and the okay. speech language pathology committee. Perfect. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Hi, Sharice. I just have a comment on the hearing aid dispensers committee. Um, just wanted to point out that at this point, at this time, we don't have a quorum for that committee. And unlike other committees, that one is legislatively uh, mandated. So it tells us exactly who's on the committee. Um, so we're hoping and keeping our fingers crossed that we get somebody appointed on that really quickly so we could take action as a committee. Yes. Paul, can we hold discussions without decisions in that in that case? Yes, that's correct. You can hold discussions, but you can't vote on anything and vote to send it to the board. Right. That we uh -huh. can at least start the process. It would start the discussions, absolutely. Yes. I'm sorry, Holly, you have your hand up? Yes. Um, yeah, actually, Todd asked some of the questions I had, so thank you for that. Um, but further, uh, since I am new to the practice committee and I'm chairing it, um, I would like to understand whether the um, the charge is to look at the language that uh, specifically was focused on last time, you know, with the, with the, um, that you have, uh, in the, um. Track changes copy, or is it looking at everything again within that law? I'm not clear on that. It would be to look at everything. I mean, 1st off, go ahead and look at the changes that are already made, but if there's also additional changes. That should be made. Okay. Anyway, I agree. It's a very good idea to take a deep dive into this. And um, as you said, when you opened up, uh, Cherie, so much has happened in the last year that impacts us. Absolutely. Is there any further board discussion or comments or questions at this point? This is Gild. I just want to say I welcome this task. Looking forward to it. Thank you. Okay, seeing other no, uh, no further board uh, comments or discussion. I'd like to open this up to for public comment. Would you guys mind if I go ahead and read the written comments we received 1st, prior to opening up the rest? Sure, go ahead. Okay, so, uh. A Kelly Douglas uh, licensed SLP wrote to support the proposal that SLP continuing education requirements are in line with ASHA requirements and other professions that do not require the majority of the hours to be live. There are many reasons this is unreasonable. 
One is that the local live offerings are often related to school-based SLPs and don't benefit those of us in acute care. Also, most live offerings do not require any interaction, thereby negating the live aspect of the course. Requiring SLPs to have different standards than other professionals with advanced degrees is unreasonable, irrational, and detrimental to the profession. There are more quality online courses online, courses available that allow flexibility in scheduling and do not take away from crucial uh, patient care, allow for financial limitations due to COVID and staffing, and allow for greater quality relevance of education. Please can submit, consider amending this requirement to be on par with PT, OT, RN, MD, RD, RT, and most other medical professions. We also have a comment from Natalie German, uh, Ray Christensen, Katrina Husted, Jenny Tipton. And that is respectfully submitting the names of myself and my colleagues who echo my sentiments and the joint efforts surrounding our concern for requiting so many in person continuing education hours for our California licensees. I used to think that this was a badge of honor that Californians had to obtain so many live hours as opposed to so many of our interdisciplinary colleagues, i.e., physicians. However, it is only that a badge. I believe it is time to leave this antiquated requirement of so many live continuing education hours. Uh, the bullet points are being able to review information is a great benefit for recorded online learning versus in person when you cannot have someone repeat multiple points because you must move on. Following what our national governing and accrediting body recommends should be taken into consideration. Given financial constraints that are only getting worse, a huge consideration for online slash recorded education hours should be made, no time off needed, no hotels, travel expenses, can use the limited education monies allotted by institutions when we need them versus having to use the benefit because we will lose it. Questions and further discussion can always be posed to the lecturer as they are now for added understanding of needed via email or phone number. Con ed hours can still be offered in person for information needing to be hands on, i.e. FEES passes, et cetera. Thank you for your time. Uh, Courtney Dillon, SLP, uh, please consider eliminating the live CEU requirement, especially since COVID-19 has forced the development of quality online pre-recorded opportunities. The end goal of maintaining the continuing education of speech language pathologists can be accomplished through the use of webinar and online courses. Uh, this one is from three individuals, including Raven Ford, SLP, Melissa Burrup, SLP, and Rebecca Evand. And this is uh, eliminate live CEUs because number one, recent technology advances eliminate any previously perceived live benefit. Two, online live courses do not require live interaction for credit. Presenters are always at three. Presenters are always available by email for follow-up questions or requests for clarifications. Four, our licensing fees are increasing and cost of live webinars are usually higher than pre-recorded offerings. Five, CA licensing board uses ASHA code of ethics for its guidelines, but not the CEU requirement. Six, COVID-19 has forced the development of quality online pre-recorded opportunities. Seven, live requirement based on outdated brick and mortar paradigm that no longer exists. And then the last comment is provided by eight individuals, Magali Benton, SLP, Elizabeth Hosey, SLP, Virginia Jones, SLP, Marissa McRae, SLP, Alicia Montoya, SLP, Rachel Perrin, SLP, Tommy Richards, RPE, and Melanie Bayara, Bay Bayara. Uh, and I'm writing in reference to item 19 on the Friday, May 14th board meeting agenda discussion of possible action regarding, I'm just gonna shorten that because it's the title of the agenda item. I would like to strongly encourage the board to eliminate the live in-person requirement with the growing availability of advanced pre-recorded seminars and rigorous research publications. This requirement has lost its value. Protection of California consumers is maintained by the quality of offerings made available up to and during the COVID challenges. Given that this requirement is unique to SLPs and AUDs, it seems arbitrary and unreasonable to maintain it considering no other professionals with advanced degrees in our clinical settings, RNs, PTs, OTs, LEPs, educators, and SLPAs share it. 
Thank you for your time and consideration of this impactful change. And those were all the written submitted comments that the board received. Okay, can we ask for other public comment? Thank you, Madam Chair. I have opened up the Q&A panel. If any member of the public would like to comment on this item, please type, I would like to make a comment using the field in the lower right-hand side of your screen and submit it to all panelists. We will give you a moment. All right, we have a Melanie. Uh, we have a couple of people that would like to make a comment, starting with Melanie Vera. Uh, Melanie, you'll have three minutes and I'll give you 30 second warning. And Melanie, uh, you have been unmuted. I just wanted to thank uh, the members of the board today for acknowledging this issue, adding it to the agenda, as well as reading those public comments um, that were emailed into you. This is a really important uh, issue for all of us speech therapists, at least here in the Sacramento region. And I really appreciate your guys' consideration into making our jobs a little more valuable and worthwhile for us. Thanks, guys. All right, the next comment is from Linda Pippert. Uh, Linda, you have been unmuted. Thank you. Thank you on board again. I'm a licensed speech language pathologist and I certainly agree with all the written comments that were sent in and and the oral comment that was just presented. Um, the quality of online programming right now is really at an all time high. It's been increasing over the last 10 years and we literally can get quality online education in every aspect of the entire field. So we appreciate your consideration of um, eliminating the um, requirement that some of our CEUs need to be in person. Thank you. All right, the next comment is from Michelle. Michelle, you've been unmuted. Um, yes, I just wanted to echo the same sentiment with what was written, what was orally said. Um, I, I would say that there's been a shift in paradigm and, and even if it hadn't been, um, it feels very rushed because um, for some people, because of the pandemic and things being online, everything just seems so different um, for certain groups. But this is something that's been in the making and happening and and, and the quality is exceptional. And I think it really um, requires us to look at some of these very antiquated requirements and know that we need to move into this new age, um, which is really not that <laughs> new, um, so that we can get education, um, continuing education to um, SLPs and audiologists. At the end of the day, it, it'll promote compliance. Um, and I also believe that, you know, if we can make that kind of education more accessible, ultimately it just helps the California consumer. I yield my time. All right, and the next comment is from Joanne Slater. Joanne, you've been unmuted. Thank you so much. Um, I am Joanne Slater. I am a member of the Continuing Education Board of the American Speech Language Hearing Association. I am also the Director of Continuing Education Administration for a company called Continued, which offers uh, online continuing education to SLPs and audiologists through speechpathology.com and audiologyonline.com. We also offer online continuing educational, excuse me, education to professions, professionals in occupational therapy, physical therapy, respiratory therapy, social work, and early childhood educators. And I just wanted to um, share with you that my knowledge of the CE rules and regulations for professionals in those, um, in those professions across the United States um, is something that is part of my everyday review and, and concern. And the the live requirements or the live course requirements for the California SLP Audiology Board are among the most stringent out of all of the boards uh, for the professions that we serve in our online spaces. So I know several years ago, the board had considered ex um, expanding the uh, self-study allowance for SLPs and audiologists and the, the, those rule changes were tabled for um, because there were other priorities 
that the board was facing at the time. But I just wanted to, um, again, thank you for revisiting this issue and encourage you to um, look at what other licensing boards are doing successfully without endangering the public in other professions. Thank you. I yield my time. All right, this is the moderator and that was the last request for public comment. Would you like me to close the Q&A panel? Yes. Okay, it's been closed. So I'd like to thank all of the public members for their comments. Um, and just wanted to verify with uh, Sharice that um, those email, I assume their email responses, public responses you got would be shared with the standing committee who will be looking at this issue? Absolutely. Committee. I can share them all. I've, I've already printed them out so we can include them. Um, so far, I think they were all from the speech language side, um, but I, I can definitely share them with all the committees. Okay. Um, so uh -huh. I don't think we need a motion on this, but it does kind of segue nicely into uh, item number 20, um, in which we're going to be talking about future agenda items and potential dates for standalone committee meetings, not necessarily topics, although I've been keeping a list as we've gone through the last two days of what topics might be addressed by the standing committees, which I can go over with Sharice later on. But can we move to item 20? future agenda items and potential dates for standalone committee meetings. Absolutely. So if any other board members okay. would like to recommend future agenda items for the board, um, we can go ahead and get those now. Can we um, talk about what the, this early morning we had a gentleman um, talk, uh, say something during open comment about audiology. Can we, can we add that in for the next agenda item? Yeah, definitely. <laughs> yes. And can I comment on that? Dr. Rajo? Yes. yes, please. Yes. This is, this is Paul Sanchez. Um, just uh, along the lines uh, of that comment, I want the board to know that anything that is presented as a public comment, um, and, and as an agenda item, the board is going to hear it. Um, however, it's not automatic that it's going to be at the next board meeting or at the next committee meeting. And sometimes, you know, in our zeal to to please and to try to get out there, we, you know, we may have made that commitment to try to get it on the next board meeting. But I just want to make it really clear that we try to get all of these items onto the agendas. But sometimes, you know, we have to prioritize and sometimes we're just not ready. We want to make sure that we're ready to discuss an issue that we've gotten the appropriate background materials, the appropriate experts involved in some cases so that we could have a, a good discussion and, and accomplish what we're setting out to accomplish. So I just wanted to let the board know that we're not ignoring public comments. We, we are actually uh, working towards getting those, uh, those issues uh, talked about. Thank you. Thank you. I agree that that topic needs to be addressed and I hope to see it on the next um, uh, agenda, but we, I think it will, it will first go to a, uh, the audiology practice committee um, first. Um, but I'd also like to add that the gentleman was actually mistaken when he said he's had no response from the board since last February. That's simply not the case. In my experience, he has been um, uh, responded to at least um, a couple of times, um, very recently, in fact. Um, are there any other um, issues you'd like to see uh, for future um, agenda items? Holly? Um, in the last meeting, I mentioned the um, interest in looking at helping um, streamline applicants that um, are, are trained in foreign countries. And, um, it did get in the notes and it's something that the discussion led to um, the need to learn before looking at that, we need to really understand what the current process is. So since then, now I'm on the enforcement uh, committee. So that will provide me a chance to learn more about that. 
so I guess I'm saying I don't want to lose touch with that being a future agenda item. I just see it being pushed out farther because there's a lot on our plate right now. Um, so do we want us to list that as a future agenda item? I, I think that th this is something that we can keep on our radar. And I, and I know that uh, the important thing for us to do is maybe try to determine whether or not this is an issue that needs to be brought before the committee or the board. So, so I think what I was suggesting is first things first, let's, let's go and let's look at the processes and, and bring in our, you know, bring in our um, specific practice board members to look at what the processes are. That's what we've done in the past. And maybe we can go from there and see if there's any improvements that can be made. That sounds good to me. And I'll look at your, to your guidance for that process. Thank you. <clears throat> Dr. Rajo, uh, this is Paul again. Another consideration uh, that I think something we need to look at. We have we have several committees that are going on, and um, if we were to schedule all the committee meetings separate from the board meetings, we could find ourselves with, you know, with with the sunset committee or the sunset meetings that are coming up. Um, we could find ourselves with. Um, a lot of meetings this year. I mean, we could, we could easily be at 10 meetings. So there, I, I do see the value in doing the committee, the committee meetings separately and standalone, but I also wonder if we want to do those committee meetings during the board meeting and have a longer board meeting. So that's something that we need to probably figure out. I don't know if we need to do it right now. We could probably even discuss it offline. Yeah, um, I know we used to do that where we would designate some of the normal board meeting to discussions of individual standing committees and then bring the report back the next day. Uh, I just want to make sure that the, the standalone, the standing committees are able to discuss some of these issues. I think we're not going to get anywhere with some of them unless we do that. Um, so, however you want to do it, we can do it. Well, I, what, but I don't well, we can work with um, uh, Sharice and I can work with you and with the committee um, chairs and, and try to make that determination. I just want to ask for flexibility from everyone because we, I, I know you're all busy and I don't want to, you know, have you coming to a board meeting every month either. I, I would also mention that um, it's not completely certain how long the um, state of emergency will last and how long we'll be meeting solely remotely. So those will also play into some of this as well um, as to whether we should be having shorter committee meetings via WebEx um, that are separate from the board meeting or maybe they're the day, first day of the board meeting. Um, I think we, we definitely need to talk about all of that. So can we can we go offline? Not today, but uh, in the coming weeks to talk about uh, committee assignments and then talk to those pertinent board standing committee chairs. About we can reach out to each of the board committee chairs. Now. Yeah, we can reach out to board committee chairs and and ask them um, what the preference might be, and then also potential um, dates to send out if it's not going to be attached to a board meeting. Okay, and what we can talk topics at that point also. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay, is there any further discussion from the board regarding future agenda items? Okay, uh, seeing none, is there any public comment on future agenda items you'd like to see? Thank you, Madam Chair. I've opened up the Q&A panel. If a member of the public would like to make a comment on this agenda item, please type. I would like to make a comment using the field in the lower right-hand corner of your screen and submit it to all panelists. We will give you a moment. All right, this is the moderator and I see no requests for public comment at this time. Would you like me to close the Q&A panel? 
Yes, thank you. You're welcome. Um, we were able to cover um, today's closed session yesterday, so um, we're not going to be obviously per pursuing that, but I would like to turn the mic over to um, Paul Sanchez for, for a comment. Yes, I, I have one more one more thing to add. Um, I have what is probably good news and bad news. Um, bad news for the board, uh, but good news for the citizens of California. We have had for the last uh, few years uh, the nice privilege of having Anthony Payne serve as our legal counsel. Anthony Payne is uh, the assistant chief counsel to the board and works in a managerial capacity, but he has been uh, filling in as our as our legal counsel for the past uh, couple years. Before that, we dealt with him as a supervising counsel. So he kind of oversaw the work of our previous legal counsels. And we just got news uh, that Anthony has been appointed to be chief counsel over the California Citizens Redistricting Commission. Um, he's also, uh, there was a write-up about him in the Orange County Breeze uh, uh, newspaper there in Orange County about his appointment. Very interesting if any of you want to read it. But, you know, I'm just very... Um, kind of disappointed and bummed that we're losing him, but I'm also very happy for him. And I just want to thank him for his service to the board and congratulate him and wish him uh, the best in his new assignment uh, with the commission. Anthony, at this time, do you want to say anything? Well, first of all, thank you, Paul. That was, uh, that was so kind. Um, and I do want to just thank the board um, and and the Department of Consumer Affairs. Uh, I've been I've been at DCA for three a little more than three and a half years. And as Paul mentioned, uh, board council for probably you know the last year and a half, two years. Uh, and um, it's it's really been a privilege and um, to help to help you all do the important job that you have to ma maintain and enhance public protection. It's been, a, it's been a real privilege. Um, uh, I'm excited about the new challenge and, and appreciate the opportunity, but um, I'm going to be missing a lot of people here at, at the board. Um, Paul's staff, Sharice, Heather, uh, there's just so many people there here that are very good and he's got a great team. Um, and uh, I'm going to miss all of you. So thank you all so much. So thank you, Anthony. I know I'll miss you. So, but wish you all the all the success in the future. Um, thank you. If, if there are no further comments, discussions that are not agendized, we can't talk about them anyway. So I would like to adjourn this meeting. <laughs> Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Thank everyone. You. Have a great weekend. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you.